So my alarms have been going off since 9.30, and um, I got out of bed like three minutes ago. So Awesome, dude. Idiot. Very Bukowski. <sighs> Uh, if if I was very Bukowski, I would have told you to fuck off until like two. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, Chambaya, Allah. Thanks for taking the time, bro. Oh, dude. Like, seriously, anytime. Like, I just dig chatting, but anytime, like, oh, hey, let's talk about Bukowski's work. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Most people don't ever want to fucking do that. So, yeah. <laughs> heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. I've been wanting to do this one for a while like this uh you know like the pleasures of the dam which is like his greatest he has so many books like yeah like too many almost like it's so many even in like the front cover of this I'll look at it and I'll be like oh my god like this guy published so much I'm like having like a total like um freak out meltdown because the one Bukowski resource that is so fucking good like last week after fucking like 20 years the person who runs it just decided they don't want to fucking deal with it anymore right it's not there was it just a web page or dude it was a database of like everything and um the community they're a bunch of fucking assholes you know like don't record that but they're a bunch of fucking assholes and um but they like help each other out. They just don't like new people coming in. Like right. it's like it's groups of people. Like who fucking gives a shit? But yeah. But um, yeah. So apparently there's somebody like I was on the forums trying to see like what the fuck was going on, and I guess somebody is going to be taking it over. But um, because of, I mean, it was like over 20 years worth of site building right. and ad stuff. And was it just like poems and stuff? Like his all of his poems and like photos yeah, and like journals? Like, and It was like the timeline is one of the things I use the most. But like everything from where he lived during what year, what books came out what year, what magazines came out what right. year. Um, like to things like uh, what his address was during this year, what his phone number was during this year, like just ridiculous shit, like letters he wrote to this person. Um, and then the thing that uh, I like most about it is, and what we'll be talking about on here, I'm sure, is um, the original versions of poems that John Martin published after he died that John Martin completely changed. But since a lot of those poems didn't get published until they're just now starting to come out, actually, over the last, like, eight or nine years or whatever. But so every once in a while, someone on that group will have, like, a copy of, like, some ridiculous little mimeo from, like, 1974 that has the original version of a poem that John Martin put out after Bukowski's death and the poems like completely fucking different. So, yeah, I noticed, and especially for this book, there's a lot of like the uncollected stuff, like, cause it was put out after his death and like, I guess his, 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 his like last wife was, uh, owns the estate still with yeah. the family. Yeah. Um, Linda Lee owns it. And um, there were, at the time of this book coming out, there were 20 unreleased poems in it. And then the rest of it was, um, like, 
his I, they're there this is kind of a greatest hits like i would still want other ones in there too but like there's some great things in here but apparently um john martin picked all of the old stuff and linda lee bailey picked the new poems that went in is the story i heard for it I mean that would make sense, especially like I didn't didn't like Courtney Love have a lot of control over that, like the the unreleased like Nirvana stuff, and she like ref that's why they didn't yeah. put out the greatest hits album till like twenty years after because like it was like what when did that that black like greatest hits album for Nirvana yeah. came out like two thousand four ish or something do with money with her right like and um. Well, I think she also didn't want that song to come out. Right. The You Know You're Right or... Uh, yeah. That song's fucking amazing. It's That's such a good song. Incredible, <laughs> yeah. Incredible that he recorded it right before he killed his yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Before he quote unquote. Right. You know, oh, are you like, a... If anybody knows, okay, like a lot of people are like, oh no, like she had him killed. And people are like, no, it was suicide. A woman is so capable of pushing a man to suicide. <laughs> like, I don't, like, whether or not <coughs> his finger was on the trigger or not, like, it really doesn't fucking matter at all. Women are very capable of making a man feel like a s small enough piece of shit to blow their own fucking brains out. Oh, yeah. Or drink themselves to death or whatever it is. Yeah, I it's it's incredible. Cause I've, I've been rewatching. Uh, I've been sick like the last like two weeks, man. Like I I just I'm still recovering, and it was like so. I you know I was sitting on the couch for a few days. You know, just incapacitated, just laying on the couch, and like uh, I've started rewatching all the True Detective seasons on HBO, and that's such a plot line. Like the 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 woman like driving the man to alcoholism or. Uh, beating them down to the point where they feel so belittled that they're lashing out in these crazy ways or or, or self-destructive ways, you know. Did you read The King in Yellow? I didn't, no, no, with the first season. Oh, uh... like one of my favorite fucking things ever, dude. Like, um, when I watched that season, I did not know that that was a part of that, like that, that, that had any basis to it. And then I was like, what the fuck is happening right now? And, um, then like I went and reread it and then rewatched it and I'm like, Oh, this is so cool. But then they fucked the whole thing up and it's fine. But like, it was, it was a fun, that was just cool. Like, right. um, the repair of reputations is seriously one of the, weirdest short stories I ever read. And like the fact that that was written in the 1800s is fucking mind blowing, dude. Yeah. And then we like start doing the whole, like, cause who was it? Was it Ambrose Bierce that wrote the, um, poem about what was it? Corsica, not Corsica. What's the Car place? Carcosa. Carcosa. Yeah just like that all of these things were based on the next thing. And then when Lovecraft finally read um, the King in yellow, he like decided to rewrite the history of the Necronomicon and just add this line. Oh yes. And it was also inspired by like chambers. <laughs> it was just like, he's like, this is really cool. I got to put this in this. Yeah. I can't let, you know, it's like um, that, that stuff's great. But yeah, that the King in yellow is like, like eight short stories and four of them like are connected in this really weird King and yellow shit. And then the other four are not very connected at all. And they're more romance because chambers was a romance author before the right. King and yellow, but That's... Oh, so good. Yeah. And I, I was one, it's interesting rewatching it now, almost 10 years later too. Like, you know, cause I was one, and I'm, this is a little preview for listeners because I, I plan to do like a long monologue. Like I've been writing reviews and mostly praise, you know, for all the seasons really. So that I've been rewatching, I was one that I was like, they hold up so well. Like, like even I wasn't a huge fan of the second season, 
but rewatching it like 10 years later now, like it's pretty good. Like it's pretty damn I haven't good. You know, like I haven't watched any of the seasons after the first season. Oh, uh, and I, so for I me, I, I'm going to write about this and release it on this podcast eventually, but it's like they, uh, I think for a season two, it was a lot of people just wanted another season one, you know, and I did too. So I was one of the people that like didn't like season two as much, but then rewatching it like a decade removed and like all the hype kind of dying down around it. I was like, it starts off a little slow, I think is the issue, but actually it's like a huge, very complex, you know, like crime plot that's, uh, works, you know, like I'm like, damn, this is high quality TV. Like this is high quality. Is the new one out yet? The new one's out. And that's what inspired me to rewatch it. Cause it's cause causing so much controversy when I was seeing like reviews, you know, people hating it. I watched the first couple episodes of the newest season, the night country season. And I kind of tapped out. It just wasn't of the same quality, you know, uh, yeah. There's like rule breaking that happens that kind of takes took me out of the show in like season two. We're just kind of like laws of physics were violated, and I was just for me that was just like a big like, ah, what are you doing? Like you didn't have to violate the laws of physics here to make a cool plot. Like this is about supposed to be like gritty realism, like you know the dark underbelly type stuff. With and then I started rewatching season three the other day, and honestly, it might be one of my favorites. Like Marshala Ali is so fucking good. Like, I don't, I don't know how he's not in more stuff. Like he's such a good actor and playing like an old man and a young man. And like, like just great. I'm like, damn, this is good. Like, and I know it got a bunch of hype when it came out, like they, all the seasons did, but I was like, damn, this thing's better than I remember. Like it was in the second season. Second season is the Vince Vaughn, Colin Farrell, uh, Rachel McAdams. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 I remember now. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy because I like all of those people for the most part. Yeah. Like you would have like wanted to watch it. And it takes place in New Orleans or was that the third uh, one? That is the third one is in Arkansas. Okay. The second one is like the California. Yeah. And so the, you would have watched it. And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Same, yeah. It's so fickle, dude. That is the benefit of streaming though, is that it is all up there to watch now, so you can go back and rewatch it whenever you want and just, yeah, just, I mean, not that it was underrated. I mean, they were, they were hugely praised, you know, but I was just like, damn, those are good. Even though like, I guess the second one and he, you know, Pizzolatto, the guy, the writer creator, he clearly like loves pulp. Like he knows all about these stuff. Like he definitely knew like reading the yellow King stuff, you know, the second oh. season was a, basically an homage to James Elroy, you know, like in his kind of L.A. crime novels. But mm -hmm. like, yeah, just great. Awesome shit, man. Yeah. yeah. I remember like right when that was happening, me and this other dude, this other like writer guy, we had a podcast for like, um, I don't know, maybe like four episodes called... Um, the true dicks podcast <laughs> it was just like because i was really big into like hard-boiled detective shit and like weird pulp stuff so yeah and he was more of a modern like detective writer and so it was like him like trying to like figure out what the difference between pulp detective shit and modern detective shit was. And we would like go over shit. And I think he just like ran out of shit to talk about. <laughs> it was yeah. like, Hey, well it's been a couple episodes. I'm done fucking talking to you now. I'm like, all right, whatever do. But that was pretty fun. That was like at the time, like, because at that time it was like the crossover was happening to streaming. It was like, yeah. like Is that these, what? 2013 2014 yeah yeah and then like the the big kind of a-list movie star actors were starting to take on like the kind of tv series roles they were like doing that Dude, i remember because like i well like even i mean this is a little different but like i remember sitting at this like really janky fucking um it's actually kind of fancy around here i guess but this uh mexican place called piquito moss and but it's like this little outdoor seating Mexican place. And I was sitting there and next to me was Brian Cranston 
talking to his wife and his wife was trying to convince him to take the part of playing this drug dealer on this fucking TV show. And he was like, but I'm a comedian and I just don't think it's going to work. And she's like, just do it. And I'm eavesdropping, eating a fucking burrito because I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I'm like, it's the dad from Malcolm in the Middle. What the right. fuck's he doing here? <laughs> and I, I think about that a lot too because Breaking Bad was like the first, like when, when crime drama stopped being that kind of CSI, NYPD Blue, and started being these like, prestige level cable tv with like big budgets and like great cinematography and great actors that that made it crazy is that it was on like a third tier network yeah and do something cool because i mean i remember hearing about breaking bad but like i didn't watch it until like the third season right because it's like everyone hyping the shit out of it and like since we're on this subject, I mean it's the fucking twenty fifth anniversary of the Sopranos. Right. Yeah. That fucking made the, all of this happen the in the first birth place. of prestige yeah. TV. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I just that's... Got, it's all over me. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> that's fucking wild. Yeah, that's great stuff, man. It's and I remember thinking about that too because I remember they had a hard time casting Walter White. And like you said, with Cranston, they 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 tried to get like uh, uh, what's his John Cusack apparently was like offered the role, and uh, Matthew Broderick and like all these kind of like, you imagine Matthew Broderick playing what like, I kind of can't. What was that show where he played somebody kind of scary? I know what you're talking about. That kind of recent, or was it a show? Yeah, like he was like was I don't know if he was a a teacher that was like scary and like killing people or something. Right, but, yeah. Like I could see it. And like, I don't know, I guess that was like a choice. Like they wanted a funny guy that people are unassuming of and then playing him against type. God, he fucking killed that part though, dude. Yeah. It's and like he's... hard to Malcolm in the middle now. Yeah. You can't you know? see him as anything else. And I know he had so many opportunities after that trying to do all these other character roles, but everybody's just like, No, you're Walter White now, dude. Like and he's still doing like cameos. Like that show ended what, like fifteen years ago now. And he's still like coming up to do cameos for the Emmys with like uh what's it, Jesse Pinkman, like the uh what was it Aaron Paul that, or something. That is the tiniest fucking like grown adult male I've ever met. Really? Like, he's fucking a tiny as shit. Like, I ran into him at Starbucks with my kid when my kid was, like, nine, and my kid was bigger than he was, dude. Jesus. I was like, get the fuck out of here. Like, um, he was, and he was wearing, like, three layers of fucking clothes on a fucking summer day in Burbank. Fucking douchebag. <laughs> he, like, I couldn't believe how tiny he was. It's always crazy with, like, actors, like, how small they are. Mm -hmm. Even, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I remember, like, he's, he's not super short, but he's, like, they make him look way taller in movies. Yeah. Like, they make him look like he's, like, six foot four or something. He's only, like, 5'10", 5'9". Like, hey, like, I'm probably the same height or a little taller than he is. Um, you know who's fucking huge, though, that I fucking did not believe was fucking Vince Vaughn. Oh, yeah, he's, like, 6'6", six, six, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He is so fucking big, dude. I couldn't fucking believe it. Oh, it's crazy. God. Yeah. And like Tom Cruise, I know is like notoriously like five, seven or something. They make him look like he's like six foot two in most of his movies. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I guess it's like if you're like on camera, I mean, it just looks more awkward if you're too tall or something like you just. Well, like I get like the whole like trying to shoot tight. So like you want your actors the same height usually right kind of thing so that all makes sense because like every picture you see of tom cruise on set he's standing on an apple box right. so you're like oh okay what was and that was that movie he did with like cameron diaz like that action movie in like the early 2000s and she's like a six foot tall you know like mod, former model and he's like five foot seven <laughs> there's like a plenty of scenes where she's just like towering over him like that's ridiculous dude. <laughs> How tall was Bukowski? Do we know? He always says he was like six foot or so, 
but um, I think he was about 5'10". Right. Um, like, whenever... Like, there's a couple, like, stories and poems where he talks about being, like, 6'1 or 6'2". But then every once in a while, like, he'll slip and he'll say, like, almost six foot. Right. And they're like, oh, so he's just trying to, like, make himself look a little bigger. <laughs> like, I, I get it. You can add a couple inches. Like, we all do. Down isn't, south and up. Isn't that crazy, dude? Like, I always, maybe it's just, like, the uh, the tall privilege or something where, like, I, it's always crazy. But, like, I never realized how much people are, like, talk about that or, like, are insecure about it or something. But I've always been like a taller guy, and I mean I'm not even that tall, you know. I'm like six two. Yeah, I was gonna hit. Yeah. yeah, and like, but I was tall like from like in eighth grade. I was you know taller than my teacher. You know, like they were towering over like you know these five foot four female teachers or something in like middle school and stuff. So like I got in trouble because I was like they were a little bit scared. Like they just. Or, you know, if something would go down, my head would just be popping up above the crowds. So they'd be like, hey, you know. Be the f- that everyone sees. They're, yeah, they're like, what's that? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm not doing anything. Like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, something's going on and I can't see anybody else. So you're in trouble. Yeah. Shit like that. But, yeah, it's always crazy, man. Some people are like, oh, yeah, six feet, six feet. I'm like, whatever, dude. Yeah, I'm fucking, I, I'm only 5'10". If we're talking like that, but like, which is the norm, like that's like the average. That's even a little more than the norm, which right. is weird. But I've been this tall since I was like in sixth grade. Yeah, that puberty and hits. So, yeah, yeah, and so it was like I was this big giant fucking oaf of a fucking human. Same. And then <laughs> I, just, I just watched everyone fucking. Like, <coughs> sprout up around me you know yeah. and that was weird. like going from being the biggest dude ever to like just like watching everyone grow like fucking weeds that was fucking hysterical high school was the fucking trip motherfuckers would leave for summer and come back like four inches taller and shit yeah it was always yeah just this the idea of of I mean, I don't know what it is. I guess it's just, like, people are, like, kind of... When you have to look up to somebody to talk to them, I guess it's a little kind of intimidating, no matter... Even if you're being perfectly nice, it's always just kind of like, whoa, you feel like a little kid again, you know? If you have to, like, look up too tall to somebody, maybe it's that, but... Yeah, man, Bukowski, lying about the height, lying about the... All that. Uh, lying about everything, dude. It's all... <laughs> I want to get into that too. Yeah, he's a professional fucking liar. It's it's amazing. As most writers are, yeah. I oh, do. All right, man. Yeah, I'm down to get into it. Yeah, like, and uh, that's what you're hearing, listeners. We're back here with uh, another episode of Heavy Board, and I am joined by the poet, filmmaker, the artur extraordinaire, the most hated man in poetry, Matt Wall, Mister Matt Wall. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Dude, it's funny that you said the most hated man, because, like, I didn't think that was really the case, but I'm starting to lean more that way. <laughs> the most hated man in American poetry. Yeah. Like, it started out as a fucking joke and a rib and shit, and now motherfuckers are, like, actually doing it. So I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, I hate that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I hate Matt Wall. <laughs> Of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast and I Hate Matt Wall Poetry and Publishing YouTube channel, and the owner and operator, distributor of Poetic Anarchy Press. You all know who he is, Mr. Matt Wall. Uh. And today we are uh, discussing uh, something that I've been wanting to do a while on this podcast. And when I, as soon as I met Matt, we met almost a year ago, maybe? Yeah. What? It was... Longer than that, wasn't it? Or no, it was about that. Yeah, I think it's yeah. about coming up on about a year ago. We met and we had our first kind of podcast together and exchanging emails. Uh, but I've been, I've been planning to do this because I wanted to always wanted to do the Bukowski thing. But you need to like I always try to find somebody that's coming on as a guest for like book chats as like that's a fan. You know, I don't want to just like assign something to 
somebody that doesn't like this writer or doesn't like the book or something because it's just better conversations when they're both fans and uh yeah. We're going to try and get to the bottom of uh, the Bukowski fandom listeners here. Uh, oh, but... shit. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, today we're covering Charles Bukowski's The Pleasures of the Damned, poems from 1951 to 1993. And this is kind of like a greatest hits book. Kind of like, mm, yeah, like the greatest hits album for Bukowski. It was put out after his death. Uh, originally published in hardcover in 2007 from Harper Collins, and the paperback edition that I got here was 2008 from the uh, Harper Collins imprint here. And we're going to be getting in today, edited by John Martin, who we will get into as well, who is uh, Bukowski's longtime editor and friend. And uh, it basically has like the greatest hits, listeners. Like those of you that don't know, it'll be linked in the description. Pick up a copy of this. But it's basically like his greatest hits and then like some uncollected poems. And uh, John Martin, John Martin's a character in himself there. And he was basically, he's the guy that discovered Bukowski, wasn't he? Um, like Bukowski was already like a huge deal by the time um, John Martin started Black Sparrow. But um, the thing is, is that without John Martin... <clears throat> um, there might not have been the initial buzz around Bukowski's books because according to legend, the only reason why Bukowski wrote a novel is because John Martin asked him to. And the thing that made Bukowski more mainstream was the fact that he wrote Post Office and then continued to write novels or whatever. But if he hadn't have signed the deal with John Martin that he did, he probably would have ended up at a larger publisher and had, um, I don't want to say more money because he ended up very well off, but yeah. his career would have gone a very different way. And he probably would not have been the cult hero that he became. Yeah. So it's, it's a, back and forth because like the legend is also that John Martin got Bukowski out of the po post office so he could write all this other shit. But if you look at the actual forms from the post office during that time, Bukowski didn't really quit as much as Bukowski got fired and he was fucked. And so like, it was kind of like one of those things where, because one of the other things that we'll probably hit, and I'm going all over the place. No, so dude, I, please. But um, when Bukowski was alive, John Martin did not really edit a lot of Bukowski stuff because Bukowski was like, fuck you, you're not going to do that. And they would get, and there's this great fight about the book Women that um, John Martin edited the fuck out of, and Bukowski lost his goddamn shit. And <clears throat> so allegedly, and I don't know this for certain, but allegedly the first release of women is a lot different than every release that came out after. Um, but after Bukowski died, um, and it wasn't right after because betting on the muse is allegedly okay. And bone palace ballet is allegedly okay. But all the books <clears throat> that came out after that up through and the people look like flowers at last were heavily, heavily edited. And um, some of the poems in here were also heavily edited. Um, and John Martin being a Scientologist. Oh shit. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, he did not like um, when Bukowski talked about smoking and drinking and drugs and there were certain things about sex and women that he didn't like either. But he would let those things go a little more. So a lot of people, when they read the stuff that came out after Bukowski died, they're like, oh, he was kind of cleaning his act up. And he was more of a... And, and it's like, no, like these poems were written 20 years ago. And if you look at the original version he's saying a lot of fucked up shit and John Martin just churched the whole fucking thing up. 
So this collection right here, I think this came out either right before the People Look Like Flowers at Last or right after. And this is the last time John Martin had his hands on Bukowski's stuff. And after that, um, Echo had, um, what's his, I always forget his name, Abel DiBurrito edit his stuff. And his thing has been making sure that the work is exactly the way Bukowski intended it, which has been nice. So, um, like the essential Bukowski, Bukowski on cats, Bukowski on writing, Bukowski on love, Bukowski on drinking. Those are the books that Abel edited. So, yeah. And you have a, uh, a kind of a Bukowski book club, right? As part of your YouTube channel and podcast, or you don't release it as part of the podcast. It's all kind of, you know, merging into one another, like here and there, right? Yeah. Tell listeners a little bit about that. Yeah. It's for the members of my YouTube channel. So, like, I usually will do, like, one, like, I'll do a video for everybody that just kind of goes over the history of a book, and then we, like, get into it. And right now we're doing War All the Time. Oh, great one. And what we've been doing is um, going through all of the Black Sparrow Echo Edition poetry novel, not novels, but big poetry collections, and we're going to go up through um, the books until his death, I think. And then we're going to decide if we want to do short stories, novels, do the posthumous collections, um, or whatever. So, like, we have, I think, like, three more books to do. Three or four more books. That's awesome. And you all, and listeners out there, you can get that at the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry and Publishing YouTube channel. Uh, a lot of good stuff happening up there. A lot of kind of, I don't want to say outsider, but just kind of like, yeah, that kind of, we're Books. doing this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. We're doing this whether you like it or not. Yeah. yeah it seems very normal for me and my um, viewers and stuff, but um, apparently it's more outsider shit. Because <laughs> we're not trying to fucking be outsider and weird and shit. It's right. just. Yeah, whatever. It's all, when you try to do that kind of stuff. Like there's there's all kinds of scenes, and it's, I'm I'm fascinated by the scenes that are springing up with. And you and I always end up talking about this. The kind of the social media factions, the different branching offs of things in the in in the in, in literature and stuff. When you're trying, like purposely trying to be like some type of edgy out, it never works. It's always like a little bit cringe, you know. So mm -hmm. just follow your heart, listeners. <laughs> follow your heart, follow your tastes. And then if people think That's you're a weirdo, whatever, you know. But I want to get into that. I want to get into his rep his reputation, uh, the Academy perception, the kind of... There's a lot of fans of Bukowski, but then there's also like the kind of a visceral hatred <laughs> of Bukowski yeah. and, 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 and what he did to the field expansion of what he was doing. And his novels, I've only read a few of his novels, like The Man, Bukowski. Like, I've read Post Office, I read Women, and Pulp. So I guess that's, like, his first novel, his last novel, and then, like, the middle, middling one, like, The Women, we came out, like, in the between, in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's always... Yeah, yeah it's sorry. The third. Women was the third, Pulp was the sixth. So, yeah. And that was, like, the 90s, right? Pulp, when he kind of... <clears throat> that actually was released after he died, but he finished it in um, 93 and then died pretty soon after that. Or wait, no, it was at 94, uh, 93, 94. Something like that. Yeah, but that was the first novel he wrote where <clears throat> like, um, his um, Chinaski character wasn't the like main character. It was more of like a just a fun fictional romp, and kind of an homage to like the kind of old pulp stuff that he because it's a very simple kind of detective story. Yeah, and that's like, what fucking true detective should be like. Season fucking five, true detective should be based on pulp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh shit, that'd be I'd watch it. Yeah, I'd watch it. It's good stuff, man. It's good stuff. But I always like to start this off when we do book chats like this, like kind of 
What's your history with this book and uh, Bukowski overall? Um, well, like my history with him is that I didn't start reading him until way later in life. And um, the reason why I started was because I kept getting these comments from readers saying like, oh, this is so Bukowski and or this reminds me of Bukowski and Paul Nick or however you fucking say that guy's right. name. And um, I hadn't read either one of those guys. And um, then it came up so much that I'm like, okay, I'm going to read both of these guys. And I got Post Office. And I can't remember what book I was the first Paul Nick book I got. Is it over there? I don't know. Like, um, the difference between the two was, I think the Paul Nick guy... Um, he wrote kind of weird and gross shit kind of for the sake of writing weird and gross shit. Yeah. Bukowski tried to write human level experience shit, but it just happened to be weird and gross (laughs) and more like soul and a lot more love and what Bukowski wrote compared to that other dude. And so, like, I was way more drawn to that. And you were already publishing your own stuff when you yeah, came to so him? This was, like, when was this? Like, 2012? Like, Black Star Canyon had already come out. Um, my first short story collection had come out. And that's where I was getting most of the, um, like, oh, yeah, this is very much, like, blah, blah, blah. Um, was based off of my short stories. So, um, but yeah, and I had, I had already like kind of walked away from filmmaking at this point and, um, yeah. So, but as soon as I found him, I felt like, like most people do when they read his shit, they feel like they found like either like a kindred spirit or like their old best friend came back and it's just like, they're like, Oh, like, <clears throat> and Bukowski even writes about this all the time. Like people will write him letters saying like people write saying, you understand me, you know, and it's just, it's just the conversational way he writes. It makes people feel like he's their buddy, like that there's a connection between the two. It's it's just, it's, um, it's a gift. A lot of people can't fucking do that. And it's just so funny because for somebody who, um, acts like the last thing they want to do is ever fucking converse with another human being on the fucking planet. Um, he can really make you feel like he gives a shit that you're fucking reading this stuff. So, yeah, there is that. And it's kind of that, that, and I want to get into this as we get further into the episode and we start reading out like poems and stuff together. It's like, I always say this where there's that, that that connection that you get with reading this, like uh, the thing he always gets criticized for, and listeners have heard me say this before, even I think Matt has heard me say this before, we've had many chats about Bukowski, where it's like, it's criticized for his lack of technique when you talk about like poetry and like the kind of techniques and things in it, but there's something that he hits, he hits something that like just grips you, you know, like, like it is, so it's like, you don't even need all that technique stuff because he's he's doing he's he's gripping you so much with just his kind of plain spoken descriptions of things and very sometimes matter of fact uh that that you can't help but kind of be charmed by it in a way like at least i mean it depends on the person right not everybody loves bukowski but like for me like this book in specifically the pleasures of the dam it was the first bukowski i ever read and it was like because I was in college at the time. I was like 19. I was in community college. And uh, I was in this writing class there. And I had a friend that, you know, we were chatting and stuff. We'd smoke cigarettes during the breaks and stuff and chat. And he kept telling me, he's like, oh, you got to read Bukowski, dude. You got to read this. And I'd be like, oh, okay, okay. And I like picked up this book. And I say it's nice and yellowed already because I've had it, you know, at this point since like, how old was I? It was probably 2009-ish. Yeah. or something i was like 19 and uh 
I couldn't put it down. Like I couldn't stop reading it. And I had never read a poetry book that made me want to keep turning the page like that, where it was like almost like pulp fiction, where you're just like, what's going on? The next one, the next one, the next one. And not that the poems were connected or anything. They were just so visceral, like reading that, like reading the descriptions, even like the, the street names in LA and stuff. Like there's almost like that pulp stuff to it, like that kind of old school, like, yeah, it was just, and it, it, I, I can only describe it to listeners as life changing. And I've said that about a few books before. I know many listeners have heard me say that, but like, it's, it's life changing for me in that way where I felt so gripped by what he was putting on the page and, and, and just like kind of how he didn't give a fuck, you know, like that's a huge appeal. Like that's a huge appeal that this guy was just like, ah, you don't think it's good? I don't give a shit. You know, like, I'm just writing shit, man. Like, you know, yeah, there's, and his books, like, you know this with your book club and stuff. These books are huge. These are like 500 page, like poetry collections. Like Matt was yeah. saying for his uh, uh, Anarchy Crew stuff on his YouTube channel, go check it out, listeners, it'll be linked below, is like, War All the Time. I remember my friend gave me that one. And like, one, the title fucking great like just the the title of that for a poetry collection and that's so fat like all of his collections are so fat 300 400 500 page poetry collections nobody's doing that like the only time you're ever going to get like a 500 page poetry collection is if you're getting like, like the works of yeah like collected animal. yeah like i have it's a huge <laughs> philip larkin one sitting next to me and it's his whole life is just in this 500 page you know collection it's like the, the he was writing constantly he was writing constantly like even when and i think the attitude too where like he was broke he wasn't making money doing it he was just like doing it because it he was compelled to you know and yeah and just putting it out there even if he, people thought it was bad or whatever he would just keep putting it out there like writing reams and reams and reams and putting out these books and i mean he became a cult icon like where people are obsessed with this guy not just him but i think like the character too like kind of like and i want to get to reputation but first i wanted to ask you like hard for sure and he he did nothing to deter people from that right for sure. yeah and i wanted to ask you like like what is it about bukowski um there's so much like, and it depends on who you're talking about picking it up. Like, are you talking about like, what is it about him that make people think that he's amazing? That kind of or just you personally or yeah. And we, I mean, you know, we don't need like I, definitive answers, I, but yeah. I think for the most part, a lot of it is he writes in such a simple way that he gives people the idea that anyone can do this. And that is a very powerful fucking thing. <clears throat> the problem is, is that when people come across Bukowski shit, they go, oh my God, he's just writing about drinking and fucking. I know how to do that. Because <sighs> this one time I drank and fucked. So let me write about that. <laughs> And then they realize, like, oh, wait, I really don't have much to write about. So there's that. The second thing is a lot of people think that he's just, like, writing about him. And um, I'm sure when we start picking poems out, um, we'll come across some stuff. And I just did a video about this not too long ago. But um, he does this thing where he brings you into the poem. So he'll say something like, you know, like me sitting here alone, typing this, you sitting there alone, reading this, you know, like he brings you into it as a part of it. Whereas when people try to emulate Bukowski, they never even think about bringing anyone else into it. They're just like, I'm going to write about me getting drunk. And I puked on my dick. And, like, that's, like, they think they have mastered the fucking art of doing it. So there's that. Um, another thing about it is, especially when you uh, are talking about, like, the outsider kind of mentality, if you think about it, um, just, like, on a socioeconomic level, um, 
the people he's writing about and the people he's writing to, there are way fucking more of them than people who are doing well and college educated and blah, 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 blah. Right. So um, there's going to be a wider net you can throw that into. On top of that, the fact that... If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard. Um, a lot of women hate him, and a lot of people dislike him. <sighs> <laughs> that makes it kind of like edgy and cool. Like, oh, hey, I just got my heart broken by some bitch. So I'm going to read Bukowski and start writing a bunch of Bukowski like stuff. Um, and chicks hate that. And so that's cool because, and it's just that whole fucking thing. And that's not even like, I think that is kind of a mischaracterization of him. But that's a whole other topic. But, um, and then just on top of that, like, hang on. I got a fucking airplane driving down my street. Okay. Um, the other thing, too, is like... Uh, oh, I fucking lost it. It'll come back. Yeah. And I I mean, I think the same. Like, I wonder if I had to, like, take a stab at what is it about this guy? And not just that, like, the persona, the reputation, the kind of... Every, like, poetry is always kind of when people think about poetry, they think of like something behind like museum glass, you know, like something that's like untouchable or, or too, too high and mighty or something like what, what's that poem he has about that, that guy who he's like trying to talk to him about like the New Yorker poems. And he's like, I don't give a shit about the New Yorker poems, you know, like he's, I don't, I'm more interested in this woman's tits. Like <laughs> I don't care about There's always these like poems and stories where like he'll be talking. And it's funny. Cause like, I think he's full of shit, but like we'll get to that probably too. But there'll be all these times where he'll be like, I'm in my apartment and this woman's reading the New Yorker, which I have no idea how it got here. And it's like, motherfucker, you keep your eye on that shit so you yeah. can keep telling yourself that you're better than that shit. Um, the but, opera but I, references, I, like, <clears throat> yeah. Because he does this thing, and I think this is his insecurity about not being accepted by academia. That, like, especially in his early shit, he was constantly, like, talking about um, classical musicians, operas, um talking about the writers that he read that people would find the kind of like obscure just so he can prove to academia that he belongs and um <clears throat> around war all the time i think is when he realized oh i don't need that and i'm better than all these people and so he like stop doing that and the only reason why i feel like it was his insecurity is because if that wasn't his insecurity he would have continued doing that his whole career now he did c constantly write about the classical music and classical musicians because that's what he listened to all the time but um all of the like there was a lot of try hard in his early shit yeah and i think that was just for him to try to gain acceptance and that's something too like i this is kind of a tangent but i think it's relevant where writers i know people listening out there like there's like everyone pretends that they don't want that that oh i don't need it i don't need the institutional kind of pat on the back but like there is something about maybe it's just the human side of every of us all, you know, like where we're just we you want to be approved of. You want that little pat on the bat. There's a, even if it's a small part of you, you know. 
and not that you know just like Bukowski where you say oh well I want it but if I'm not going to get it you know I'm not going to obsess over it you know fuck you you know uh but there is that desire I think it's mainly it's a desire to be more so read than it is to be necessarily approved of by the academy or like you know the New Yorker or something but then like you said like he reached a point where he was more widely read than any of the people getting right. that. Yeah. So like, you know, he kind of realized that he, he did achieve that pat on the back, but in a different way where he just got it from the readers. And that's really what, what I think people want. And then I guess just kind of like the institutional, we use the term gatekeepers now, but just kind of that like institutional ivory tower type places. They just, that's how you get a, a wider readership usually, unless you are Bukowski or, or do it, you know, or Matt Wall, where you just kind of go out there and do it yourself, right? And you get your own readership uh, selling well, copies of books, you know? Like, like I, I'm a very firm believer that what people say when they're drunk is kind of like a very clear window into their soul. And it, it, there's a lot of different poems and stories where when Bukowski's fucking wrecked, he either is telling people that he won the Pulitzer or when cops come and get him they're He's like, Oh, are you here to give me my Pulitzer? <laughs> and like, like, I think that that was always something that he thought he deserved and he wanted, you know, but like, it, it, it's just, Bukowski, for all of his machismo bullshit, was a horribly, horribly insecure fucking person. And um, I think that there's a lot of insecure men out there who, when they read his shit, like, it might not be, like, a conscious thing that they notice, but they feel that same way. Yeah. It's just Bukowski was successful being insecure. You know, that's yeah. the difference. I think that's a very under-discussed topic, you know, when people talk about, especially in the last 10 years, of the kind of toxic masculinity discourse that's been everywhere. It is, I think there's, at the root of it, even when it gets, you know, incredibly toxic, you know, he's not denying that there's incredibly toxic parts to masculinity. It's based on that insecurity. It's, it's, it's like an insecure thing. And there's, I don't know, it's like a... a I, maybe it's that same thing as you want that warm embrace of an institution. You want that warm embrace of, of somebody to, uh, I don't know, love you for something that you've done or like that quote. What is that quote? I forget to remember who did most men live lives of quiet desperation. Like the reason that's such a famous quote, right? I mean, it's just, it's true. Like it's that insecurity thing like, that like these, these, yeah, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, I'm kind of... I think as time goes, that's going to get less and less. Like, men's desperation will be quite loud. <laughs> but like, yeah. Um, but and as you out, age as a man, as you mature. Yeah, but yeah. Like coming out of the Great Depression, you know, because he was a child of the Great Depression. Right. And that, like, my grandparents were children of the Great Depression. Same, yeah. And they were very much of the... Thing, like you don't fucking bitch and complain about anything because you don't know how well you have it because there was a time when we didn't have shit. Right. So, and if you're a man, especially you don't fucking bitch about anything. That's why motherfuckers are dropping dead of heart attacks at 50. You know what I'm saying? Cause they right. bottle all shit up and like, um, their fucking heart explodes. So, but I think we're getting farther and farther away from that. But, um, I still feel like, um, as far as like toxic masculinity goes, like just the idea of men not being able to um, show emotion. And honestly, that might be one of the charms of Bukowski too, because he wasn't allowed to do that. But when he wrote, he was. Right. And I get that. That's know? one thing I, I, I always notice and you see interviews of him and stuff like that. What was that famous documentary where he's hammered drunk talking to that guy and the guy's like, oh, you write about all this kind of stuff. And he's like, what? That's what you took from it? That's what you took? Okay. Like, you know, Ooh. he's like, this is sensitive. He's like, I'm a sensitive guy, man. Like, and I think that's true. Like, I think a, a lot of times we do confuse because male sensitivity is different. Like, it's a little bit different. And when people expect it to be more female, they'll be like, oh, well, you should just. 
I don't know. It just men hide it. There's a layer of it that that is just obscures it to most people. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, maybe even uh, insecurity in terms of him trying to disguise that sensitivity with these references to fucking hookers or like you know drowning a whole bottle of, of liquor and. Well, like that interview you're talking about, like um, I think it was like a belgian or like a german interview and it was like right after women came out and the guy was asking him like why he hates women so much right. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking about like where did you get that and um but the thing is like bukowski was fucking terrified of women like he wanted the company of women he wanted to be around women but he didn't understand them and the fact that he didn't understand them made him feel horribly inferior because he couldn't figure them out and like the whole thing i always go back to is like there's nothing to figure out it's just like they're people like everybody else they just like there's an attraction in there, but I also think Bukowski was like a closet bisexual, you know, and he didn't know how to talk about that. So that's like a whole other fucking can of worms to get into if you ever yeah. wanted to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I think you're right. I think that, I think a lot of men are scared of women and not that like, Oh, they're cowering afraid, but it's because, they're des they desire this and then they don't really know how to do it so they just kind of get scared it takes work it takes yeah. he was always ugly right so every time he even probably bothered to try he would get rejected until he was you know a well-known writer and and i guess there's speculation as to how true how much how true some of that stuff is with these kind of young girls throwing themselves at him when he was like an old man um that was probably more true than it seems right yeah just like the fame aspect and the kind of yeah like yeah it was honestly, not to be fucking funny but like if i'm pulling what i'm pulling like i'm sure he was pulling a lot <laughs> <laughs> i think that's an appeal though i think that is an appeal to his writing right like that is they call it, and I mean, was he massages? Probably. Uh, you know, I didn't know the guy, but we can we can guess based on things. But like, I think and there the period it was a very misogynist period. Yeah. So he was just saying what everyone <coughs> was saying at the bars or behind closed doors, you know. But like, there is like is doing anything different. There is this kind of uh, tendency, I think, to categorize kind of male sexuality as inherently misogynistic, that this kind of, because you are desiring women, you know, like that is just part of it. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's part of his appeal, too, is that he was very honest, right, like, like about that kind of thing. And yeah. uh, usually, especially, I guess, the 20th century, you had to kind of mask that a little bit more. And he just didn't. Uh, and then that got a huge audience for people. Uh, you see it even well, now sometimes with some of these people that are that are doing that are getting large followings. I mean, I don't know where I'm going with this, but, you know. Well, the other thing about him was, so before John Martin gave him the deal in 1970, which the alleged deal was, I will give you $100.00 every month for the rest of your life if you give me everything that you write and like as time has gone like it ended up being not a hundred dollars but a quarter of what john martin made and that just happened to be enough to make bukowski comfortable living whatever before that he was already writing the weekly article in the um uh in open city <clears throat> which was like kind of like the LA Weekly or OC Weekly, um, whatever weekly magazine there is. And um, pretty soon those were being, um, what do you call it when you it's syndicated? So like in the New Orleans version of the weekly magazine, those were going out in there. And so he was already being read weekly all across the country 
by people who would read a weekly rag. Beyond that, he was also already considered the king of the mimeos. So like all the little like um, mimeographed um, lit journals, he was in like fucking all of them. And so everyone in the poetry world already knew who he was. And he was also writing um, like sex stories for the porno mags. Right. At this time, because those were the only things that actually paid good money. And so he realized, too, the crazier his stories were, the more he would get paid and the more they would be published. And so when <clears throat> um, his short stories started getting picked up in normal places, um, a lot of the times those short stories were stories that he had already published in the porno mags. So a lot of those stories and like what he would even say is I would have a short story that I couldn't sell anywhere. And so in the middle of it, I put this like crazy sex shit or like where he beats the shit out of some chick and then has uh. sex with her. And then the porno mags would pick it up. But because those were published, like nobody knew the internet, nobody knew of all this shit. Like those things ended up going out in normal publications. And so he ended up with the fucking, um, I don't know, the the idea that he was this horrific womanizing um, borderline rapist motherfucker. <laughs> and um, because he got a following writing shit like that, he just kind of kept up with it. And that was basically his MO through the seventies. By the time the eighties rolled around, he kind of got away from all that shit. I, I would love to do a podcast. If anybody, listeners out there, if anybody has a lot of information on this or can set me up with somebody who's an expert in this, with like how important the porno mags were to literature in the 60s and 70s. Just Dude. Yeah. Because Steve, Stephen King got his start doing that, yep. you know, in the 70s. And it was just Bukowski was getting in there. Like these kind of the impact it had, because that was what men were reading, you know, who yeah. the much bigger subscriber base too than like the New Yorker or something. Cause the men were getting the porno mags and there was no, you know, internet porn for free. Like, stuff dude, like that. Like, it's like fucking Vonnegut, Wolf, yeah. Thompson, all these motherfuckers were fucking putting shit in Playboy and fucking like even like raunchier shit than that. But like yeah. even it was the period too. Cause like even in film, like a lot of the, big filmmakers especially in genre filmmaking um they were not making enough money making movies so they were making porn and a lot of like the studios like um <clears throat> what was it um like Wes Craven and Sean Cunningham like working together on Last House on the Left which kind of launched both of their careers right like they did the only way they were able to do that was because they made a shit ton of money, not a shit ton, but they made enough money making fucking porn in the early seventies. And then they finally were like, okay, let's make this like modern version of the Virgin spring and um, try to get all artsy. And so like, we wouldn't have like Friday the 13th or nightmare on Elm street or anything like that. If it wasn't for the fact that these guys were able to make a living making porn. And then you know. mentioning that, I'm thinking about how sexual those kind of early slasher movies were and stuff because of that. I'm, I'm just, that's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then at that time, too, like there was the like porno chic, you know, like Deep Throat came out right. and it was like acceptable to to have like a couple go out on a date in New York and go to a porno theater. It wasn't where homeless people were jerking off and sleeping. It was like <laughs> Pee Wee Herman in there real fucking thing yeah. and like so deep throat the devil and miss jones um debbie does dallas and Miss else beyond the green door or whatever it's called <coughs> something inside miss beethoven or whatever the fuck <laughs> it's all like common culture right at the time, you know and so but like looking back on it now if you were to tell a bunch of people, hey, everyone that you fucking like and think is really cool started off in the adult business, they would be like, ew, that's gross. You know, like, um, that's nasty. But subscribe to my OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I think oh. but there's an appeal though. There's an appeal to sleaze. Like mm-hmm. this kind of, it's, it's a taboo topic. I always, I said like Stephen King would always say this, so they would, you know, hundreds of hours of interviews everybody can see where he was just, people always ask him, what makes a great story? And he says, the forbidden, the taboo. He's like, that's what people go to stories for is they want to see something sleazy, inappropriate, something forbidden that you couldn't just talk about in polite company, you know, like, uh, or in a normal social setting. And it, it makes sense that there was this huge kind of sleaze porn industry where all of these great writers and artists and filmmakers were coming out of because it was one, it's only, like you said, the only way they could make money with their art was doing that for at first. But then just like how the crossover isn't so unusual, you know, like it's not so unusual to see that kind of sleazy crossover, even the pulp stuff, the early pulp stuff, 30s, 40s and stuff like there was a lot of sexual elements or you know it was a little different because it was at that time you couldn't even really publish like really sleazy stuff in in literature but like they was hinted at right like the kind of the motels the kind of uh the prostitutes you know the kind of shanty towns outside the cities like yeah that's very important like i didn't even think about it it's a weird time (laughs) the 70s man yeah (laughs) I wasn't even alive in the seventies. I just it's just stories, you know. To me. <laughs> Pretend. I don't even think it's real. Yeah. I hear you. That's interesting too though. Like you said, like yeah, like it's how much is exaggerated and how much is confession. I, I remember in grad school I wanted to uh write this I never ended up writing it, but there was this paper I thought about writing where like on Bukowski where how much of Bukowski stuff is confessional right is it confessional or is it fictionalized and uh he blurs the line for sure because we can like you said with that database you can find some kind of things that line up and you can kind of be oh maybe it's real or not but like you know part of creativity is exaggerating is embellishing is kind of i don't want to say lying but yeah you know making it up he's making up stories he's exaggerating things like is is that okay so he didn't get like huge until he was like well into his fifties. Right. Okay. And so and he lived until like mid seventies. Okay. So if we take this, even though he has thousands of pages of written work, if you took all of the stories that he talks about and were to like sit down and like map it out day by day, like you only really have like maybe three to six months of crazy living in that period. And a lot of people, I think, think that it was like every day he's like getting drunk and fucking hookers and fucking betting on horses and doing the whole fucking thing. But like, you have to understand the motherfucker lived a long time. This isn't some writer that died at 24. John you know, Keats. Yeah. Like, he had a huge long ass life. And a lot of the stuff he wrote if you are really familiar with this stuff, you'll realize that a lot of poems he wrote and a lot of short stories he wrote are topics that he's already talked about. Like he'll talk, he'll write like eight or nine poems about the same event at different points in his life because he was so drunk when he was writing, he couldn't remember if he had already written about something or not. You know what I'm saying? So he would like go, Oh, remember that one time? Oh, I'm going to write something about that. And it's like, dude, you've already written like three poems about that. And a short story. Like, why are you writing about it again? He doesn't fucking know. He's just writing. He didn't give a shit. So, like, the actual amount of time that this dude lived, like, some wild and crazy life was probably about three to six months. That's my guess. And, like, like, some of the behaviors, too, where it's, like, you know, it's a sleazy behavior, but it's not really, like... What, you know pornographic like just going to the racetrack every day or something like that's kind of like a bomb sleazy behavior that's kind of titillating but like it's kind of boring too right like this guy would literally just sit there and get drunk and like sit there for a few hours at the racetrack you know no idea how boring sitting through a fucking nine race card at the racetrack is right yeah that is a long fucking day with nothing really happening like it, like shit goes down for like maybe a minute and a half. Right. Every race. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, oh, and then they God. take an hour to corral the next round of horses in. And then you sit there and yeah. It's, oh, it's place killer. your bets. And then you sit. Yeah. My grand, that was a big for his generation. You know, like my grandparents generation. I'm always like, 
they did that right like they would take me to the racetrack like it was like an event you know what racetrack were you by uh the i grew up in baltimore so pimlico oh shit was dude. the big one yeah what's the other one out there um oh there's, there's another there's charles Yes, and there's there's smaller ones kind of scattered around, but like I guess, uh, I guess since the Pimlico was part of like the big racing circuit, uh, yeah, dude, I fucking grew up um, in Cyprus, and the Los Alamitos racetrack is actually in Cyprus, and um, so I would go there all the time, and like my sister's husband, his family, um, I don't know if they used to own the track or what their involvement with the track is but like they um like her husband like grew up there so he was working on the horses and a lot of my um childhood friends growing up like their dads were like trainers and shit so like going to the track was like normal ass shit right and it wasn't until i was in high school when i was like oh i can make money doing this like oh shit i'm gonna like get some tickets and like I looked a lot older when I was in high school and I just don't think people gave a shit back then because I could like go into liquor stores and buy beer and right. porno shit when I was like 14 so um we would go and I would just try to scrape up a couple bucks to just at least bet on one race and hope that I could keep it going kind of thing um but yeah so like and it was weird like I just never even thought that there were other racetracks other than La Salle. I'm like, oh yeah, that's the racetrack. That's where horses run. So like, like I, when I was a kid, I thought like the Kentucky Derby happened at La Salle. Like I didn't understand there were different places, you know, it's fucking weird, but yeah, there used to be tons of tracks and now there's, it's not as big as it used to be. Yeah. Like I remember, I mean, I was too young, but you know, my grandparents would take me and they would let me pick a horse, you know, and then they'd place the bet for me or something, you know, I was like eight years old, but like, I'd be, oh, I like that one just because I like the color of the horse or whatever. You know, I didn't know what I was betting on. And they'd put like a dollar or two down. But like, and that was just fun because then you could like follow the horse through the track there. And then, yeah. But also back in the day before they, they changed the rules recently. Uh, I think like in the last 15 years, but you used to be able to just bring alcohol into like the Pimlico racetrack. So people would just bring cases of like beer and just like sit and sit it next to them in one of the, you know, the, the concrete bleachers yeah. and just be like drinking a 30 pack all day. I don't know how that works because um, I remember last year I went to Santa Anita and I had a cold bag full of fucking sandwiches and like, um, like, three tall boy fucking uh, chiladas and shit. Uh, and, like, nobody even fucking looked at me. And I just fucking, like, went and I sat. I'm like, can I do this? Because, like, there was this thing where if you sat in the center of the track, like, in the infield, like, you could bring picnics. Right. Do all that shit. And I saw people bringing booze to the track. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. So I just started, like bringing shit to the track and nobody fucking said anything to me and i'm like oh, okay i'll just keep doing this because dude those drinks get fucking expensive bro especially yeah. when you're losing fuck That's oh so yeah fun. i'm just making a cup of coffee yeah no here. worries bro yeah no worries yeah <sighs> i feel like we've gone all over the place and it's probably my fault no nah, dude so- Dude, this is podcasting, bro. I always say the podcasting is just us chatting, like, wherever it goes. There's no rules on this podcast either, you know? I'm not running a course. Like, I'm not, oh, let's stay on topic. Nah, fuck that, you know? Like, this is this is whatever comes up, whatever pops into the head. Is that your teacher voice? Yeah, 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 you know? Like, let's yeah. Stay on you topic. must Yeah, stay on topic and have, like, this very planned out, like, you know, let's go from this time period to this. No, you know, this is podcasting. You want that? Take a college course. You know, to come to this podcast and go to Matt Wall's podcast for, you know, honest, just kind of whatever, shooting the shit. Like, this is, that's what's fun. You know, like, these kind of conversations over some coffee, over some cigarettes, over some drinks, you know, like, that's what's fun. And I said, I want to get into this, like with the, I want to do another jerk shop with you at the end of this here too, if you got the time where, uh, not so much workshop stuff. I want to talk about self-publishing with you if you got, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I, I'm, 
I'm fascinated by that. And I'm, I'm fascinated by how well it's doing, you know, for a lot of people to, to build careers with just kind of doing it themselves. But yeah, I'll go to that. But dude, I mean, yeah, we haven't even gotten to poems yet and shit, but I I've still have more questions like Bukowski's yeah. reputation, like, you know, his, his, and we've touched on a little bit of this, but what do we think of that? Like his reputation, you know, like how much of it is, is based on the lifestyle or perceived lifestyle or, or just the kind of the fact that he just wrote reams of stuff and didn't give a fuck, you know, and just kept putting it out there. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to do with the fact that he published so much that there's just so many different books of his, you can see that that, has kind of kept him in the limelight. Um, I feel like in over the last few years, it's been difficult because of like his content and like the whole like Me Too thing. Like, cause he had a book that was supposed to come out um, in 2020 that got canceled. Really? But, I didn't hear about this. What, what? Yeah. And oh, this is amazing. So the, the book was called Bukowski 100. And it was um, a, a DiBurrito edited book that was uh, going to be like a huge, big fuck you greatest hits collection, right. original edits, like original manuscripts of his shit. <clears throat> and um, uh, Echo Harper Collins put out the book cover. They put up pre-orders. I ordered the book and the audio book and it was supposed to come out in June and it didn't come out and it was said to come out in August and then it didn't come out and then it just was like never heard about again. Right. And all throughout this time, if you were to pick up a book of Bukowski's from like Barnes and Noble or something, it would have this little sticker, a little yellow sticker that had a little drawing of Bukowski and it would say a hundred next to it. Right. Um, because they were like prepping that this was going to happen. But um, I don't know if it was the Me Too shit, if it was the George Floyd BLM shit, or if it was, um, I would have to think it was more on the women's side of things, but um, the book just like disappeared. And so I wrote Harper Collins and tried to find out like what the fuck was going on. And no one was getting back to me. And then finally somebody was like, the book's not coming out. And I'm like, oh, what happened with the book? All we can tell you is that the book's not coming out. Right. And I'm just like, motherfuckers, dude. Like, because, like, just for, like, an audiobook thing, um, like, if you go on Audible, like, there are no audiobooks of his poetry. Like, you could get audiobooks of his um, short stories and of his novels but um, I would love to have like a good audio book of his poetry because like you can find like old audio recordings of him reading, which right. is cool because it's him. But the recording quality is garbage. Right. What I'm saying? Because it was so usually I, done live at like some college auditoriums. It was echoes. And there was this other thing, too, where um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the name of it was like the book. At Terror Street and Agony Way, which actually preceded Post Office. It was, I think, one of the first actual book books that um, Black Sparrow put out of his. Um, that or originated from him taking a bunch of poems to his friend's house that had a reel-to-reel -reel recorder. And um, he's like, just, you know, read these poems. And um, he read the poems and then I don't know what happened. The tapes got busted and the poems ended up in the trash or something like that. And um, the dude like who was like, these poems are great. So he rewrote the poems for him off of Bukowski reading the reels and then gave him the machine and said, just keep reading poems because this sounds great. So a lot of the like um, audio versions of Bukowski stuff, like 70 minutes in hell, 90 minutes in hell. Um, there's a couple other ones. A lot of them are poems just pulled from him reading these poems in his living room. Right. But it, like, it's 
it's not like the worst quality in the world, but it's not good. You know? Yeah, and those those reel to reels they were they were so fragile, you know, like they're easily damaged, and then you lose a huge chunk of it or something. Like a little bit of moisture gets in there. Was you're not supposed to record on both sides, and he didn't know that, so he would record on one side and then turn the reels over and record again and delete what was, he just <sighs> did for so. And I. That you know, at that time too, and I mean, it's it's easy with hindsight to look back and be like, "Oh, that was ridiculous in 2020." But like, it's, I mean, there was a Norman Mailer collection. I think that was that had the same thing happen to it. Like, and I, of course, I knew about Norman Mailer because it's the more literary kind of thing that I would follow. And it was like, I remember that. Like, it was just a, it was like a collection of his old essays or something, you know. And he was very important at the time. Like, he was, yes, he was, you know, famously kind of misogynist and and racist and things like that. But like. He wrote a lot of important essays, especially in the 60s, for like what was happening and stuff. And people were just freaking out about it. Oh, we can't publish this. Or, oh, you know, like it's like that's really what irritates me. And I know I'm, I've kind of, to my own kind of chagrin, I, I'm getting a reputation of being against that kind of stuff. But it's, it's not the politics. You know, like I'm not against, you know, women stopping misogyny or standing up for themselves. Like I'm, I'm against politics ruining something that could have been great. Like we, we wanted this book. Like, like why did, why did the, you know, what pisses me off is the politics prevented this book from coming out now. Like, like, yeah. you know, and it's like, fuck that. I don't, you know, you can do the politics, but this is literature, baby. Like we're talking about, this is important literature. These are important writers that lived at a time. Yeah, sure. We can look back now in horror, but it's like, yeah. And it just drives me crazy when I'm like, now it's affecting literature. Now it's affecting this where like, I would have loved to have this book. I would have loved to, you know, yeah, pre-order this Bukowski book and have it on the shelf and stuff. But like, now we just can't like, now it's just been taken away from us. And, be, and, and, and I'm just like, damn, like we don't have to do that. Like, you know, that like, we can all get along. Like we can all, we can have all of it, baby. We can have it all. Like we don't need to be. It's, yeah. it's just difficult. Cause I think with echo, cause echo, like Harper Collins um, bought the rights to Black Sparrow Press or bought Black Sparrow Press. I don't know exactly how it worked out. They've all been consolidating like the last twenty yeah. years. Yeah, I think I'm not a hundred percent, but I think Echo was created originally as a shell company almost <laughs> to be able to put Bukowski stuff out without getting anything dirty on Harper Collins. And then since then, Echo has turned into this like really art house, um, like A24 version right. of Collins, you know. But the problem is, and I don't know if this is necessarily a problem, but if you look at um, the last time I looked at it, this is what it was. So probably around 2020 is when I looked last. But the entire board, like of who's in charge and who's the editors over there and all this stuff, they're all fucking women. Oh, yeah which is fine, but like they're probably not going to want to put out a bunch of Bukowski shit. But the thing is that fucking cracks me up and I will guarantee fucking hard old fucking cash here, guys, is that that giant library of Bukowski shit that Echo has put out is the only thing that bankrolls that fucking division of HarperCollins. Right. Like if it weren't for those Bukowski books – everything else that comes out of echo no one would ever fucking see like that is the thing that keeps them in the fucking black dude yeah Guarante yeah i i always think about that too where there is this kind of you know there's all these things oh men don't buy books men don't read books and i'm like yeah well you look at what's being put out and then you look at what's controlled like all of these boards i mean it's not everywhere but it's like i think it's like 70 some percent of the entire industry between like the editors, the, the, the agents, the, the boards, the kind of editorial boards are women. It's like the 76% of it. And that's great, right? That's great. But then it's like, okay, but like it's, you know, the world is more than just that. Like it's, it's more than just, you, you want to expand the audience and you want to expand, like uh, have, more books sold overall like well you then you need to be catering to all these different audiences you know you can't just cater to the one audience well the other thing that makes it difficult is that like the world is a very different place now than it was even 20 fucking years ago right i'm not just talking about social stuff i'm talking about like how we consume media yeah and the only way book publishers feel like they're going to be able 
to make money with a book is if they could convince Hollywood to make a TV show or a movie based off of one of their books. And because they make so much money when they do that, that's marketing. And they don't put anything into how they used to to get people excited about a book coming out. And it's just, it is what it is, dude. Yeah. It's once people realize like, oh, this is how you make a chocolate chip cookie. They will never want to hear another recipe. Right. Because they can make these cookies. So if they put out a hundred books over the next five years and five of them end up becoming the next big Netflix show, like they don't give a shit that they fucking lost their ass on every other book that fucking came out. Yeah, that is, it's such an insane business model. It's so stupid. Yeah. I've been looking for people that it's always weird. I mean, I know you know this when you're, when you're doing podcast stuff, you know, you're cold emailing, you're cold DMing people being like, Hey, would you like to come on, talk about something? And a lot of times, you know, most of the time, nobody, people don't respond, right? Like most of the time, at least that's what I get. Most of the time people are just not responding <laughs> So <laughs> when I'm reaching out to them and I'm like, you know, whatever, you don't have to come on, but I am just kind of, I want to talk to somebody who's in the industry and just kind of give me a better idea. Cause I'm not there, you know, like I would just like to hear. I've begged people from there to come right. on here and talk to me about this and it's just nothing, but the funny thing is how you said, like, you send emails out and people, like, just don't respond. What I what ends up with me, I'll send emails out. People respond and say, oh, yeah, I totally want to come on. And I'm like, oh, well, why don't you listen to an episode or two and then let me know if you still want to. Then I never hear back from them. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's, when, that's when I'm like, oh, why did I fucking do that? But the last thing I want to do is have someone say they want to do it and then me get ready for it. And then at the last minute they pull out. Like, I would rather them pull out way before I'm getting ready. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. that's been so many times, dude. Like, especially on my Instagram DMs. My Instagram DMs are full of people who said they wanted to come on the show and then never got back to me again. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's, and especially in the Academy side, when I email writers or DM them or something, they'll like be like initially kind of like, oh, I'm intrigued. And then like they just stop you know, replying, I'll be like, okay, do you want this date, this date, this kind of thing? And it's just like, I'm like, all right, dude, like, I, I promise I'm, I'm very nice. <laughs> like, I promise we, we don't have to talk about whatever, like, you know. The thing that's really funny is that lately I've been getting more people hitting me up because I have talked shit on their book or something. Oh, damn. Hit me up and they're like, hey, um, I'm glad you like talked about my book, but like, I really don't like what you said about it and stuff. And I'm like, Oh, that's cool, man. You want to come on and we'll like talk about it on the show. And they're like, yeah, totally. I'm like, all right, just pick a date. Let's do it. Nothing. I don't hear yeah. anything else. And yet, like, it's so funny, dude. Oh, it cracks me up. It's kind of a shame. Yeah. Because then it shuts down, com- like shuts down kind of the conversation too. Whereas the, the world is expanding and particularly the world of literature to all these different areas, like his self-publishing and stuff. Like I always say like, you know, 20 years ago, people would still be scoffing at self-publishing and people still do, but like, you know, you can't as much anymore because it's, it's getting such a foothold in, in, in literature and the way we, you know, the way it's changed that we buy books. Most people are just buying them on Amazon now. Like, it doesn't matter if you're in a bookstore or not. And like, well, I mean, I, I, again, I just did a video on this, like, and this might be more of the jerk shop shit, but um, like all of traditional publishing's business models, as far as sales goes, is based off of the fact that they know 80% of their books are going to be sold through Amazon. Right. So books they put out have to be able to adhere to Amazon's algorithm if they want to be able to be successful. So they write to the algorithm. And that's why we're in this weird kind of um depression era of literature where nothing really new is happening and everything is cookie cutter based on how amazon can sell a book yeah and it sucks and i'm sure a lot of the writers who are like popular right now are writers who are getting signed to big book deals are probably really good writers, but I'm sure editorial at those publishers have fucking gutted and fucked 
those books to oblivion to make sure that Amazon could push that book for him. Because the Amazon algorithm is the most brilliant fucking thing in the world. Like, you do not have to spend money on marketing if you make the right book that Amazon can go, oh, people who have bought all of this stuff would buy this. We will push this to these people. Yeah. But it is fucking terrifyingly brilliant. But um, the publishers have finally caught on, like traditional publishing has finally caught on that, oh, this is the future. We need to write to this market. And it's not, the market is not a fan base anymore. The market is how AI can push that book into someone's email box. Yeah. It's fucking it's weird. And I've, I read some interesting articles about how that's even changed the way book cover art is designed now because they're trying to get it to stand out in a sea of little thumbnails on like. Because that's the thing, like your, your, your book cover has to be able to catch someone's attention in a inch by half inch fucking little rectangle and colors matter and fonts matter. So, like, whatever the big book in, like, like if you write thrillers, your book cover has to look exactly like the bestseller thriller cover. And each genre has um, certain colors that are used more often than not. And so you have to use those colors. You have to use, your title needs to be, like, a third of the size. And, like, if it's a s certain type of book, like, the picture has to be really little, like, in the bottom third. And if it's not, if it's like a different genre, the picture has to be big on the side. Like it's every genre is has a specific type of book cover. It's fucking ridiculous, dude. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's interesting how it's almost like these decisions are, they're not even being determined by the market anymore. It's just like this kind of, they're being made for us by these kind of sales algorithms, you know, like they're, they're, it's not even, oh, and if you, I always say this too, and I want to get to this in the, the second part where we, you look at the biggest writers right now, at least the, the, the non-literary, the ones that are doing thriller, sci-fi, romance, they're all coming out of a self-publishing thing. Colleen it's, Hoover, it's, that, that, that sci-fi guy, what's his name, something, uh, Sanderson or something. And, um, oh, Brian Sanderson. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 there was another kind of I'm, crime thriller guy. The biggest... You know, like that Silo show um, came out of his Howl series, or is it Howl? No, Wool. I, that's Ginsburg. Come on, dude. Yeah, I think he was like a British crime writer or something. There's another guy that got like a big. He just got signed to a huge kind of main big publishing house deal, but his first five books were all self-published on Amazon. You know, huh. and like he's starting to get so now he's starting to get good money for it. But it's just. It's weird. It's very strange. And I I mean, I always, I, I just mean, this, got an email it, from, uh, this, what? Who'd you, who'd you get an email from? Uh, I, I don't want to say his name, but he's a literary agent, kind of a bigger literary agent where I, I sent him, you know, stuff, uh, and his reply, I thought it was in a, it was fine, you know, perfectly polite and all that, very professional, but it was just, it kind of implied that I was too dangerous to take on, you know, uh, Be work or because of other things i mean he didn't get into that kind of you know it was just kind of a little couple sentence reply like you know thanks but no thanks but it was like yeah that's the wording i thought was strange because usually they don't even respond when you're they're not interested you know uh but he kind of made it seem like i was he's just said something about how he's being very cautious right now and i just you know this type of stuff i'm i can't take on because it's just not well, cautious like enough I, I would say that that would be probably more about your social media activity than right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's I'm always it always kind of. I mean, I know it, it comes off as bitter, but it, I was I was just thinking like, yeah, like, wouldn't that help sell books? <laughs> like, wouldn't that help when people would be like, oh my god, like, it doesn't well, that... no, if you take a certain stance, right? Um a publisher is not going to agree with if they put you out. That's like them saying they approve of this message. Right. It's all one thing now. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's all connected in that sense. And I get that. I do. It's, yeah. It's always been like that. But the problem is now is that we could go on Twitter and say whatever fucking thing we want. It didn't right. fucking. Happen. And it's fucking there forever. And yeah. if you sell enough books, it doesn't matter. Right. Like it, it like it's well, like. If you have enough of a fan base that you're selling enough books on your own without a publisher, right. like you don't have a publisher. Right. Say whatever the fuck you want on Twitter and sell as many books self published as you want. And like you don't fucking need them. All right. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast. Become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, just the stories I've heard recently of people I know who have been traditionally published. I mean, they're better off getting a job at McDonald's, dude. Right. Yeah. Like they're getting fucked like yeah. ridiculously. So like, I don't like it's, it's this whole idea that traditional publishing is such a, huge badge of honor that it's almost like sweatshop it's like well you're gonna work for us no matter what and we'll give you whatever the fuck we want because this is gonna help you you know we're doing you a fucking favor here and that's not what it should be it should be like i'm making you a shit ton of money so fucking cut me in on it yeah yeah and when you are selling that, like it is kind of like, well, if you can sell more than 250 copies, you're already ahead of the game anyway. You know, if you can do that with no marketing, you know, self-publishing, yeah. you're already ahead of the game. Kind of like Bukowski, right? I mean, like Bukowski didn't quite self-publish, but it was still like this kind of slow growth, right? Like word of mouth. Yeah, was... It's like shit. He went from... Because one of the things here is like his wife, the painter, I think, is the oldest poem in this collection. And I think this says the collection started in 51. Yeah. I I think that that poem is actually older than that. I think that that was the one that came out in um, Portfolio that uh, Carice Crosby put out. And he was in there with Janae and fucking um, Sororian. And shit like that. Um, and I think that was the 40s when that happened. But, <clears throat> like, he didn't really write again, like, uh, his alleged 10-year drunk, which um, the book Factotum is about, was when he, like, gave up on writing. And then he didn't start again until, like, the mid-50s or late fifties, like I'm, I'm thinking more like 56, 57. And, um, that's when he just started putting his, sending his shit out to any fucking human being that had anywhere near a fucking magazine. So all of the mimeos that he was in between like 57 and like probably 68 <clears throat> were all self-published little magazines you know like i mean it took him 10 years of doing that before um city lights put out um notes of a dirty old man which was a collection of the articles he wrote for the free press and open city and shit you know that was i think his first big thing and then it all started snowballing from there so i'm yeah. take it takes decades to become an overnight success. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize how old I was until my therapist pointed it out the other day. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, I've been doing this for 25 fucking years. Fuck uh, you. Like, and I'm like, and she's like more like 30 and I'm like, you need to shut your fucking mouth. Uh, like, paying the bill here, bitch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I have like five more years before I'm world famous. So <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's it's the, it's it's, uh, it's always after your uh, after you're once dead. You made it, dude. Yeah, once if you're, you're still alive and you're fifty, you're gonna make it. If, if <laughs> not fifty yet, or you're not dead, you still got some time. One hundred percent. All right, let's uh, let's get into some poems. So what did you really like out of this? So for me, I always, I marked a bunch as I was going through, and I mean, it's such a huge book, and I like when you have things like this that start in like 51 or whatever and keep going, 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 and I like, like, was like around like halfway in the book, he start, you start getting poems where he's kind of almost bragging about his success, you know, and, and all yep. that. Uh, I like a lot of that. But the first one, it was on page nine, the Dark Night poem. Very small little one. I'll read it for a couple people. And listeners, you'll hear me. I'm not going to pay that much attention to line breaks because Bukowski didn't really want us to. He didn't really have them in there. Uh, But yeah, so Dark Knight poem. They say that nothing is wasted. Either that or it all is. And that's it, right? That's one little sentence in the whole thing. And I usually don't like small little poems like this. I usually am like, ah, you know, you could do more with this, you know. If poem this small better be like really good, but this one, like stuff like this, like it's very, I I don't know. There's just, it's maybe it's about the attitude. Maybe it's like uh, more than anything else. Like it it gets so brief and, and I'm almost thinking like, like this is what I always talk about where he's capturing that kind of visceral. Like I, I wanted to make like an Ezra Pound comparison in terms of, capturing that something that kind of that is like and this one's you could you could criticize you oh it's vague so they they stay right who is they they say that nothing is wasted what are we talking about nothing either that or it all is but it's still managed like it still manages to capture that that like we know what he's talking about right like yeah. like even though it is kind of this vague and this one is an uncollected one it says in the book here it wasn't in any of his original collections he was a big Ezra Pound fan, at least until he was um, until the end of the correspondence with that Sherry Martinelli chick that allegedly had been fucking Ezra Pound. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I get that. And it's like themes. He always kind of has the same themes but they're always kind of about living life, right? Like they're always kind of about being satisfied with life or I don't know. Being resigned to life is more how I see a lot of his shit. Like even when he was successful. So like, like we're all the time he was already tasting success. Like, cause like uh, play the piano drunk. Like that was hit the last book that came out in the seventies and um, he was already tasting like the, the pussy from being famous, right? Not necessarily being fucking filthy ass fucking rich from being famous. Um, That wouldn't come until a little bit later. But like, if you read like um, you get so alone, sometimes it just makes sense or whatever. <clears throat> most of those poems are about he has already made it and the and then everything after that it's like that and so a lot of people who loved Bukowski's like boozing and hookers shit got a little bummed out when he sold out in air quotes <laughs> to um have a better life and if like if you've never read Hollywood <clears throat> you totally should because like that really just like um, kind of puts into like just watching somebody who came from nothing suddenly getting things. It's it's weird for him and it's weird reading it. Yeah. But it's kind of like a happy ending to a fucking horrible tragedy, you know? the kind of wealth that he was able to accumulate. And then I think that might be part of the reputation too, or at least why people would say they don't like him is that they're, 
I don't want to say jealous of the success he got off of it, but also, but like they kind of are, right? Like, because people want that success. They totally are. I mean, like, and I don't know if you're talking about like actual other poets and other writers, or if you're just talking about average motherfuckers, but But all of it. Yeah. Like, as far as like other poets and other writers, like motherfuckers are jealous of me and I don't have shit. (laughs) I am doing something that they haven't been able to do. <clears throat> it's just fucking weird because like I'm sitting here going shit. I'm like kind of broke for the next two days until my next payment comes in. You know what I'm saying? And, but like these motherfuckers who, I don't know, like have their fucking tenure at some dumbass fucking university or whatever. Like they're like upset that I sell books you know and it it boggles my fucking mind but you know to each their own i guess yeah there's a poem in here about selling out that i want to cover right but it's uh is it uh gold in your eye okay something like that yeah i want to get to that later but then one of my favorites and this was one of my favorites when i first read this book it's good because i have the same copy of this book with its kind of pages turning yellow now where i have like little highlighting things that i put in here when i was like 19 you know yeah and uh it's always interesting going back now, but one of my favorites that he wrote ever was the, a future congressman. Okay. Page oh, 26. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very simple. And it's almost, it's much more narrative because he was always very kind of narrative heavy in his poetry, you know, as opposed to lyric, right. For all those nerds out there. Uh, but they're always uh, easy to read here. So we'll read it. And then Matt and I'll chat a little bit. Uh, a future congressman. In the men's room at the track, this boy of about seven or eight years old came out of a stall, and the man waiting for him, probably his father, asked, What did you do with the racing program? I gave it to you to keep. No, said the boy. I ain't seen it. I don't have it. They walked off, and I went into the stall, because it was the only one available, and there in the toilet was the program. I tried to flush the program away, but it just swam sluggishly about and remained. I got out of there and found another empty stall. That boy was ready for his life to come. He would undoubtedly be highly successful. The lying little prick. (laughs) And the fact that it's called like a future congressman. So the title's doing like a lot of work, you know? That is. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that it's just about this little kid lying to his dad about like something that's so minor and insignificant, you know, and racing programs are free. Like they just hand them out, you know, like they just hand them out at the, at the tracks or, you know, the game or whatever. Like you just get the program, the concert, they just like start handing them out. (laughs) But like this kid's lying about it. And I guess maybe it's the fact that he's talking about like how lying will lead to success, right? Oh, there's sure. kind of some brutal honesty in that. Yeah, he always said like, um, like if you've read Ham on Rye, which if you haven't, you probably should. Like, as far as like a literary piece, like Ham on Rye is probably the closest thing he ever did to that. But um, he talks about. Uh, one of the things that they wanted to do, like Herbert Hoover was coming to the LA Coliseum to speak. And the teacher said, um, if anyone goes and writes about what they saw, um, they'll get extra credit or something. And his parents wouldn't take him. So he wrote about what he thought it would be like. And um, the teacher said that like um when they turned him in that this is like her favorite piece and like come on come on up and read it henry and um so he talked about like how like when the president came out to speak everyone was silent and all paying attention and even the birds um stopped flying and started paying attention to him and the sky opened up and all this other shit And um, everyone loved it. And some people were crying and all this other shit. And he's like, and that's when I knew that all they wanted was lies. And if I just lied to everyone, that they would be happy. Right. (laughs) It's so fucking funny, dude. And and there's, the reality is, is I think there's there's something comfortable, comforting about certain lies, right? Like, oh, for sure certain ones we tell ourselves or, or, or 
I guess it's human to lie. We're like one of the only animals that can. Mm -hmm. And just, yeah, complimenting people or whatever. Well, I mean, shit, every dude who wants to get laid has to fucking tell some fabrication of a fucking lie. If you want to see how people lie, go on Tinder and read some fucking profiles. And if it's not just bold-faced lies, it's um, bending the truth enough to seem more desirable. Right. It's like a, like a, like a job application. Like a, totally. It's a job yeah, application. Yeah. Real, because every date is just an interview. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It's uh, and there there was like a. I always this other poem stood out to me. It's uh, on page forty-two. It's upon reading an interview with a best-selling novelist in our metropolitan daily newspaper. Oh my fucking god! Dude. <laughs> yeah, where we were talking about kind of like yeah, like his own insecurities and stuff. But the fact that I think that he was maybe even honest about those insecurities in this kind of writing helped him or it helps because he was always so honest about his shortcomings and i don't think people understand that like he'll tell you that he's a coward he will tell you that he's terrified of women you know what i'm saying yeah and like the fact that he was insecure about his looks and all that like it's in this one we're and, and i think he the reason i put this one is i think there's some dickinson references in this too you know like people mm -hmm. At, like he wasn't well read or something like he wasn't reading these great writers you know he was like he was very much enamored by them yeah like uh this one they always read fast it's, it's, it's funny too because these are like these 500 page books but they read pretty quickly oh yeah so uh, upon reading an interview with a best-selling novelist in our metropolitan daily newspaper he talks like he writes, and he has a face like a dove, untouched by externals. A little shiver of horror runs through me as I read about his comfortable, assured success. I am going to write an important novel next year, he says. Next year? I skip some paragraphs, but the interview goes on for two and a half pages more. It's like milk spilled on a tablecloth. It's as soothing as talcum powder. It's the bones of an eaten fish. It's a damp stain on a faded necktie. It's a gathering hum. This man is very fortunate that he is not standing in a line at a soup kitchen. This man has no concept of failure because he has paid so well for it. I am lying on the bed, reading. I drop the paper to the floor. Then I hear a sound. It is a small flying buzz. It is a small fly buzzing. I watch it flying, circling the room in an irregular pattern. Life at last. And for me... This screamed Emily Dickinson in terms, especially those last couple lines when he's referring to the fly buzzing and circling around his head, right? I heard a fly buzz when I died, one of her most famous poems. And, uh, yeah, I just think that, like, I was seeing this and I was like, yeah, you know, he never gets enough credit for some of this stuff, this kind of the literary ambition that is within this stuff where it's almost, I don't want to say it's an act, but he's like, oh, I don't care, I don't care. But he did have these kind of literary ambitions where he was using these kind of literary devices to bring in a poem like something from Emily Dickinson or yeah, like Ezra Pound. Uh, yeah. He, um, especially like from like high school age, I would say maybe even a little bit before that up through, um, the probably all through the fifties, even, um, he was reading everything and um hating everything thinking that he always better but he would take the things that he knew the upper echelon motherfuckers would recognize like he wasn't stupid it was all calculated yeah you know what i'm saying yeah and i so, i i was get... list some listeners regular listeners will know this i, I interviewed a poet recently where we were talking about this. We were talking about maybe even the unearned confidence of writers, right? Like they haven't even earned it yet, but they are just so confident. Mm. And just how that's kind of required, like to have the gall to write something down and then expect people to read it is kind of a narcissistic, you know, huge kind of self, you know, unearned self-confidence. But then it's like, 
we don't want to read somebody who's like, oh, shucks, I'm so humble. You know, we don't want to read that. We want to read somebody who's like, I'm king shit. You know, like I'm John Keats. I always make the comparison because Keats was not shy about calling himself a genius. You know, like he was not shy about being like, I'm the next Shakespeare and everybody should, you know, look on my work, she mighty in despair. Although I know that's not Keats, listeners. You're all looking, you're going to go out and correct me. But yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, still. Um, the passage even says, I'm trying to remember what it's in. I think it's in one of the novels. It's probably in Women. But he says, um, writers who've had their work published and are famous think their work is great. Writers who've had their stuff put out in magazines think they're great. Writers who haven't submitted their work anywhere really think they're great. Like, it's this thing, like, regardless of who's reading your shit if you're a writer you think that someone gives two fucks right. about your existence you know it's it's weird just to have you know? the balls to put it down on paper is kind of an act of of yeah like narcissistic kind of self obsession maybe mm -hmm. uh, even if you're not writing about yourself right yeah, yeah. for real and it's kind of required, yeah, that there's a kind of confidence that's required to even, yeah, to have the balls to just write something and, and, and try to get people to read it or see it or put it's, on a play. I think it's even worse now <clears throat> with, like, social media. Like, like, you have to have the balls to not only put some stuff out, but put some stuff out that strangers are going to read, your friends are going to read, and your family's going to read. Like, right. you have to really fucking up your own ass yeah <laughs> which, which is why i don't when i post my poems i do not connect it to facebook because i am not that ballsy enough to think that my parents want to read my shit yeah because all the boomers on on facebook dude boop, facebook i don't even use facebook anymore yeah like it's uh whew. That's, uh, I think Tim Dillon always had this funny thing where he would like do this bit about how like Facebook's a graveyard. Like when you start scrolling Facebook, if you're like used to scrolling Twitter or Instagram or something or Twitch or, you know, any of the other, even YouTube now, I think is basically social media when you start, you know, endless scrolling yeah. is basically like, and then you go to like Facebook, you're like, oh, this is like a graveyard, just like the color of it. Like it's all blue and it's like, it's kind of like, yeah. what's going on with this? Like, <laughs> the boomers funny. are arguing about like memes that are like 10 years old. Like, <laughs> and, and it's like, like I have Facebook so I could talk to members of my family or just keep up with them to make right. sure they're not dead. And then like people I knew from like junior high and high school. <clears throat> again to make sure they're not dead because like within the last year actually a lot of them have died which is sad that is but yeah. Um, yeah. one of the things that you see on there all the fucking time and it just like i'll see one and i'm like i'm not gonna spend any time here it'll be like if you know what this is you're fucking old and it's like a rotary phone right and yeah like, classic yeah Good one there, man. Yeah. Oh, or yeah, like I the dial-up tone. Everybody's making like memes about. I was like, okay, well, it was like twenty years ago. Like I was alive. Uh, I was a teenager. Like, <laughs> getting on uh, AOL. One of these. Yeah, it's just like I'm like, good God, do you really need fucking social media to tell you that you're fucking old? Like I had a, you, you watched Family Ties. You're old. Like, I had don't this worry. friend who, you know, we were just out at dinner and we, it came up and he was taught, he doesn't use any social media or anything. And he's a little bit older than me, but like, he just doesn't need to, you know, he doesn't, was never, he's a little bit older, so it never became a thing for him and he doesn't need it for work or anything. And so he was just like, you know, he said what he notices is like, you know, you see these divorces, you see all this stuff happening, like people get into fights and he's just like, you know, part of me just thinks like we weren't meant to like keep in touch with everybody we ever came in contact with in our life. You know, like it was used to be, it was always normal to have, yeah, some people would be lifelong friends that you'd keep in your life forever. And then other times people would come in for a couple of years and then come out and that was fine. You know, it wasn't like bad blood either. It was just like a mutual parting, whatever, you know, you move on, you move away, whatever it is, you get a new job. So, so you write a long ass letter just to yeah. make sure other fuckers aren't dead. Right. Yeah. And then it kind of adds a whole new social dynamic to living life when now that you're forever connected to anyone that you just happen to have a passing connection to, you know, uh, 
and then they start commenting on posts or whatever, and then you're like, what? Like, I don't even know you really. Like, you know, like, yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. I always say it's so under-discussed, but then it's discussed all the time, you know, but it's also just not report. I just, we haven't studied what it's doing to our psychology because of things like that, like because of our social, how we are changing the social dynamics that are very new. There's a few, you know, I like Jonathan Haidt, that social psychologist at NYU, and like he's kind of just started to be studying this stuff and he's putting out really interesting stuff about especially with teens is mainly his focus but just how like suicide rates are going up and all this kind of stuff and especially in young teens young girls that are like teenage level and it's 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 alarming you know like it's kind of like yeah this shit is changing us man and we don't even know exactly how or why it's doing it we should be studying this yeah so knew that like i think like whenever something needs to be studied like it won't be studied until people go oh shit all these people are dead yeah yeah probably look into this and i think where we're at now is the oh shit we need to look into this yeah yeah i'm sure all of this stuff will start um studies will start i mean there's already been studies but they're not very good because the pool isn't that big but like it'll just get more and more and more for sure um i was going to read this one please yeah this one i don't know if i could share my screen i don't know if you want to see this or not oh wait i can share my screen let me see i've never done it on this but yeah try it out um open system preferences what Oh man, now I'm in I'm in the belly of the beast here. Yeah, what Microsoft does not make this kind of stuff easy. Oh, well, anyway, what I'm going to do is read to you a um a typewritten manuscript for a poem called Thoughts from a Stone Bench in Venice. And um at the bottom it's signed Charles Bukowski nine fifteen seventy I can't see what that is. Is it five or eight? Five. Um and I think this is on page like five hundred and something in that book. Do you have it there? Uh yeah, let me see it. What's it called again? Um Thoughts from a Stone Bench in Venice. Might have been way off on the page number. I don't remember. The good thing about this is it does have an index of titles. Oh, nice. So I can find it pretty quickly here. Get to the T's. 289 in this book. Yeah, here we go. I found it. Yep. There's okay, actually so- a chunk of this, too, that I uh, have highlighted from when I was, like, 19. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read the um, original version, and you just follow along and go, Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I sit on these benches and look out at the sea and the freaks and the lovers. I need new eyes, new mouths, new pillows, new cunts, new (laughs) bathroom floor mats. Every old stud with half an eye in his head loves to charm and ride a new young calf. When I think of men moving their sat or mowing their Saturday lawns and playing football, baseball, basketball, with their sons, I feel like vomiting across all horizons. The family stinks of Christ and the American Stock Exchange. The family stinks of safety and numbness and Thanksgiving turkeys. The family stinks of packed automobiles driving through redwood forests. I need new eyes, new cunts, new ankles, new sounds, new betrayals. I don't want a long funeral procession behind me when I die. I want to move on without weights. I want the sullen darkness. I want the tomb like these walls now. Me here without digression. Solid, cranky, immaculate. I hold me. That's what there is. (laughs) So, obviously, there's a couple words that John Martin would pull out of this. And I think there were actually just some things where he was kind of running on and Martin didn't think he needed to run on that much. Yeah. There's the, the word cunts is, uh, uh replaced with woman, <laughs> you know, in every instance in the, in the printed book. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So that's <laughs> one thing I found, um, just looking quickly. 
um, for like original manuscripts based compared to what came out. And so, why? And you said John Martin would edit those kind of, you know, like the word cunt out because he was a Scientologist. Yeah. Damn. Isn't that crazy? You know, like, I guess because the intensity is more nowadays with kind of the, I don't, I guess I will just use the term political correctness, you know, but like, you know, I know that it's, I don't like that term very much, but it's, it's just like, but that's always been the case, right? Like there's always been these kind of blasphemy, you know, laws, these kind of pearl clutching at certain words or phrases or images, you know, uh, it's just crazy. Yeah, like at that time too, you think of like, oh, he was writing in these sleaze magazines, but then like this editor that's like this kind of Scientologist guy is like, oh, you can't use the word cunt. You know, you can't use that. Like, He never did that when Bukowski was alive because Bukowski would have fucking lost his goddamn mind. So, um, but I think too, because like later in a lot of the collections, like each collection that came out after Bukowski died it got worse and worse to the point where I feel like John Martin felt like, you know, I could write better than this. Right. And he was changing titles of poems. He was changing complete like themes of poems and it was just getting more ridiculous and more ridiculous. And I don't know if you could still get them. I'm sure you can, but um, if you go on lulu.com there was a guy who went and got all the manuscripts that he could find at all of the universities that have Bukowski's stuff. And he put out four or three. I don't know. I have them. They're called either Back to the Machine Gun or something like that. But he put out all of the manuscripts that he could find of Bukowski's stuff. And that's how anyone knows that any of this stuff got fucking totally changed. Right. And when people started, and the reason why he did this is because a lot of people on those Bukowski forums were like putting up images from like Wormwood Review that had something of Bukowski's that was in a book. And it was like a completely different poem. And um, it's just, uh, it's wild. You know, but I mean, I guess like everyone gets edited to shit if they yeah. go with sure. But it's just weird to think that that happened to Bukowski. You know, because yeah, I, I Bukowski would have just said, you know what, I don't want to be published. Fuck that. I'll just go to the track. And I think like, that's a destroy my shit. That's a big, long, you know, age old debate too with how important is the relationship with the editor? Because back in the day too, when you would get assigned to these editors at these publishing houses. You know, you would just, like, the famous one is Raymond Carver and Gordon Lish, right? The, the Mr. Fiction, the editor who basically made Raymond Carver what he is. And, uh, you know, it came out many years later where when Carver was was horrified by, like, how the Lish would cut up his stories and make them kind of minimalist. And, uh, you know, I think what was the book where he... Um, he like re republished some of his stories after Lish was no longer editing him and they were much longer, you know, and some people would say not as good uh, because they were kind of more traditional fiction and not like the kind of very short minimalist fiction. Uh, and I love Carver, you know, great short stories, great writer. Uh, but it is kind of like, yeah, how important is that to like the relationship and does the editor make the writer, you know, like uh, it's very interesting to think about. Yeah. Like with this, was because I don't know enough history about Carver, but like the the feeling I get when I read him is that <clears throat> his stories always end where most people's stories would start. Like his stories seem to always be like the things that happen in the beginning that would make something interesting happen afterwards, and then it ends right when something interesting is about to happen. Now, was that more Carver's style or was that Lish's like killing the story like before it would get start moving? That's the debate, right? I guess if you asked Carver, he would say it was Lish. Like there are some letters that came out after their after his death where it was he was basically begging Lish to 
to stop cutting, <laughs> you know, to stop chopping up these stories. And Lish was like, no, it's better this way. You know, it's better this way. Uh, and then this, I, I interviewed a poet recently. We actually hit it up. Shout out to Sarah Fletcher where she came on the pod. We had a great conversation and she's agreed to come back. Listeners, we're going to do a, a longer kind of uh, multiple part uh, episode on some, some big poets, complete works. But like she, she, w we were having this discussion about, yeah, the kind of like, you know, the, the purpose of editing and, and, and like, you know, it, are, is the editor trying to make it the, the, the best that the poem wants to be, or are they trying to make it, you know, to their own personal taste or trying to make it into something else, you know, like something that it's not like, you know, a good editor will be careful about stuff like that, where they're listening and they're, they're paying attention to what this story or this book or this poem wants to be, as opposed to what they want it to be, you know, like, uh, and that is a big distinction. I think it's a subtle distinction, but it's very important when it comes to artistic output and like, yeah, especially with publishing and, and things like that. Are there any editors out there who are notorious for trying to like kind of take over somebody's work and like make their editorial thumbprint more important than the writers? I'm sure there are. Uh, I don't know of any personally just cause I'm not that into the world. Yeah. About it. Like that sounds like a fucking movie. Yeah. You know? Like, Jesus Christ, there's got to be, like, one super egotistical piece of shit that just, like, changed every fucking thing. <laughs> or or that, 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 that movie American Fiction that just came out. I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard some people that. talking about, yeah, where that's kind of in it, right? Like, that's kind of a part of it where, you know, the writer doesn't really, he's like, ah, oh, fuck this, you know, like, these editors are... are, are... Yeah. The movie was too long, and it was made for too many different audiences. And I, I like I like Issa Rae. Like I like I think she's great. So I, I think she's hilarious. And like I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, but I just it's just interesting that that's you know movies are being made about things like that. Yeah, first movie I've seen in a movie theater in like twelve years. <laughs> that was funny. You know, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> But listeners, yeah, write in about that if you know if you're thinking of this or if you know somebody who has this reputation because we don't like I'm not uh, in in the world enough to know any of the kind of intricacies like that. And like I said, when I do try to email people that are, they're always a little more hesitant to <laughs> to come on the heavy board. <laughs> uh, there is a part of me that kind of likes that though. That kind of likes of like. Mm. Like, oh, you don't want to come on mine? Like, are you a little afraid of mine? Like, are, are you a... Let's see here. Oh, that's a... Yeah, there's a lot of, like, really famous ones in here. I don't know if Tragedy of the Leaves is in here. I always thought that was, like, kind of his most famous poem. Oh, Like a Dolphin. If you want to talk... I wish I had it. Um, like a Dolphin is not the poem Bukowski wrote. Um, shit. I wonder if I could Google that real quick. Let me see if I could find it real quick. Um, uh, give me a page five forty four in this one, <sighs> and I think it was in the original his book, uh, "Sifting Through the Madness." Yeah, that is um, one of the ones that came out um, after his death. Yeah, and that was when I bought at Barnes and Noble when I started getting into him, the sifting through the madness for the word, the line, the way. Yeah. Um, where is it? Is this okay? Um, oh shit! Should I just email this to you, or um, I've got it see. opened up here if you. Okay. Well, <clears throat> the original. Let me see if I can just download this and open it up so it's bigger. So I can fucking actually read it with my... Okay, so the original um, title of this was Stone Tiger Frozen Sea. <laughs> and it says, Hard dying, rough edges turned up, no slipping by now. The warden has his eye on me, the bad eye. I'm doing conscious time, locked against it. I'm not the first just telling you how it goes. I've done the darker shades, the place of populous 
blurs. The old songs still play. My hand to my chin. I dream of nothingness. The dead years pile about me. That's all. That's all. That's all. Damn. And I'm reading the edited version, I guess, of a, along with you here in the book, and it's so different. It's that one is like probably the most egregious one. <laughs> yeah, here let me let me read and listeners just to compare where yeah the same thing which says the dying has its rough edge, no escaping now. The warden has his eye on me, his bad eye. I'm doing hard time now in solitary, locked down. I'm not the first nor the last. I'm just telling you how it is. I sit in my own shadow now. The face of the people's, people grows dim. The old songs still play. Hand to my chin. I dream of nothing when my lost childhood leaps like a dolphin in the frozen sea. Like, so, that was just John Martin trying to play poet, dude. Right, yeah. Like, that is not at all what he fucking... <laughs> and it is like, when you listen to the, like, the, version, the original version that Matt read, listeners, it's like there's a rawness in there. Like there isn't even the kind of mention of a dolphin like, no. uh, or the frozen sea. Uh, and then like you kind of, yeah, it's like almost softening the raw edges in a way, like sanding it down, you know? Like when John Martin starts going, you know what? I'm going to start metaphoring in here. <laughs> like that, it's like, no dude, like you fucked up. Like that's not your job. And because Bukowski's thing, what, what what draws me to somebody like Bukowski, even after my years of education where I'm supposed to not like him anymore, you know, like it's like it's the rawness of it that is the visceral kind of it draws me into it. So when you when you soften up that rawness and try, you know, he's not known for metaphor, like he's not making these elaborate metaphors, he'll do more simile than he'll do metaphor and he'll oh. like. And so when you're trying to like add that in, it almost doesn't quite fit into, it makes the poem a little less remarkable because you're softening out the rawness and kind of trying to add more poetic elements that, that just weren't his style, weren't yeah. his taste, weren't his, yeah. Let me piss real quick. Yeah, I got to piss too, dude, yeah. <clears throat> Fuck it. What time is it? Oh my god. I'm just heating up some coffee while I'm drinking a beer like a douchebag. Oh damn. It's one o'clock. Buk very Bukowski. Oh my god, I'm fucking dying here, dude. Oh. Um <clears throat> oh, yeah, they don't have pants on, so I kept moving the camera up. All right. <laughs> Lucky I have a shirt on, dude. Okay. Uh, so that's very Bukowski too, podcasting without pants. <laughs> if I only had a robe. <laughs> Gotta get the robe, dude. The, become a bathrobe guy. Oh, yeah. My arms don't fit in them. Like, they yeah. always, like, fit stupid. And so I just, I'm like, fuck it. I always have to buy, yeah, I go a size up usually if I'm doing robes because of that. Yeah, the chest and the, the back. Yeah, so, like yeah. I, my, my shoulders are wider than most shirts. So right. if I fit a shirt that fits my shoulders and my arms, I'm wearing a dress, you know, or like yeah. a micro, and it looks ridiculous. So I just gave up on sleeves years ago. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. There, 
that's an a- interesting aspect of social media too, where they call it the micro celebrity, right? Like they call it like a niche internet micro celebrity where you can be famous technic you know, not like you're not like an A list actor or anything or like, you know, Joyce Carol Oates or some of these huge writers and poets, but like you can be micro famous now. Where you're yeah. famous in this little faction of social media. Like so your YouTube channel and like Instagram, you know, whatever it is. And you don't need that many, you know, you need a couple thousand people and now all of a sudden you're micro famous because how yeah. many people have a couple thousand people that know who they are, you know, like not many, like, and, uh, because like under the name creep creeperson, I did a bunch of other shit. I had a total other fucking life. Right. right. And I was, um, on a date with this chick, um, a couple months ago. And she fucking said, she's like, Oh my God, this is so crazy. Like I've never, been on a date with anyone who had a wikipedia page right and i'm what the fuck are you talking about and i had completely forgot that there's a creep creeperson wikipedia page and like i went and looked at it and like that shit hasn't been updated since like 2012 but like the fact that it's there um i don't know so i've i've just been having like kind of like a a weird like six months i'm gonna say like it's been um, <clears throat> like I'm seeing how I come off to people right. more than who I am, and that has been. Um, and they're not the same, yeah. And they're not the same, yeah. And it's it's freaking me out. And it's like as soon as someone says something like that, I completely pull back because the whole reason why I started like going on dating apps and shit like that is because the last two relationships I had, I only had because the people were fans of what I did and then met me and then we started dating. And especially with my last ex, I felt like it was totally unfair because she knew a lot about me because she had been a reader of my work. And my work is very autobiographical. Right. And I felt like she kind of weaponized that to manipulate me into certain things. Yeah. And I didn't shit about her you know and so i wanted to like because i mean honestly for the last like 20 plus years every single woman i've been with i had been with because of what i do you know what i'm saying so i wanted to just go into dating as like fresh where nobody knows shit about me and it's a completely different world once they find out like what i do Cause like, I don't like, I mean, like, like how you're saying micro celebrity, like that's even sounds weird. Right. Yeah. I don't, there's like, I just do shit and that's what I do because I've been doing this so long. I don't know how to do anything else. Like the only thing that keeps me from being homeless is the fact that there's enough people who give two shits that I do stuff, you know, like these people aren't fucking like putting me in a big house. They're just keeping me from starvation. You know, it's like, it's barely fucking like, I don't know. And it's so weird that like just that is enough to make people completely change their boundaries and their standards. You know, it's fucking weird. Yeah. I like Brady Sinellis, uh, his podcast. And he, he talks about that with like, he said, you know, that happened to him when he was young. He blew up very quickly with his first book. And he said he started to realize doing interviews and, you know, USA, you know, Good Morning America type spots. He started realizing he's like, there was there was me. There was like the real Brett. And then there was this like kind of fictionalized version of me that people were like talking about and calling me the you know, Brat Pack and like all this stuff. And he's yeah. like, and I kind of leaned into it. Like I kind of was like, okay. Well, if that's what they want me to perform, you know, I'll perform that in public. But like, that's not me. You know, like that's not actually me. Kowski, it's, it's the lie that people want to hear. You know, if yeah. you, if you lie, you can be a politician, and right. being a politician is no different than fucking being famous. Yeah, you know, like you have to. I mean, fuck, like you probably know this too. Like. You have to be a politician if you want to get your book published right. based on what you've done on social media. Right. 
it's like you have to be a fake version of yourself and you have to be an amplified fake version of yourself. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. It's always strange. Like the first time you get treated as like for me and I have nothing like the level of what you have, but I'm, it's like, when people start treating me like I'm some type of expert, you know, like that I like, Oh, well, you know about, I'm like, I don't know shit. Like, (laughs) I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, like, I'm not a tenured professor. Like I've never, you know, been, uh, in that type of area. Like they've never been considered an expert, but now all of a sudden I've kind of put myself out there and then you, that's all it takes right now that you're out there people treat you that way and it, well, it's the first time i got treated that way i was at this big um film market in santa monica that happens every and um i got i got into this thing for free that costs hundreds of dollars to go to and then if you get like a special vip pass you could go into the ballroom and i was just like well i walked in for free i'm just gonna kind of push my way through the ballroom and see if i could get in and then security came and they're like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Let me let you in. I'm a huge fan of yours, Mr. Smith. And I was like, huh? And he's like, dude, I fucking love clerks. <sighs> and I'm OK, thanks, man. And I'm like that motherfucker. And I'm like thinking that like all these motherfuckers are being nice to me because of who I am. But no, they just thought I was Kevin Smith yeah. because I'm, I'm a fat motherfucker with a beard. <sighs> so that worked out. <laughs> That knocked me down to size real quick. As it, Stephen King told a story about when he he when Carrie got really big, and you know he wasn't like a huge household name yet, but like he said he was at like a Nathan's hot dog stand in New York, and he like ordered some dogs and was just kind of sitting at the counter with a book reading. He said one of the clerks kept looking at him, like kind of giving him that look, and they're like, "I know you." Like they came up to him and they're like, "I know." He's like, "Oh yeah, you know." They're like, "Yeah, you." You're, you're famous, aren't you? And he's like, well, you know, not really. Like, and they're just, no, 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 no. You're Francis Ford Coppola. Like, you know, like, because he had like that beard or whatever, in, like the 70s. And he just said, yeah, it was pretty humbling. Like, you know, oh, no, no, no. It's like, <laughs> you think I directed The Godfather? Like, yeah. yeah. That's fucking hysterical, dude. That's so fucking funny. Especially for writers, because nobody really knows who you are. They know the name more than they know the face if you're like a big time. Yeah. That's I mean, funny. it's a strange world. It's a, even now that like, you have political celebrities. So it used to be if you were a well known politician or celebrity status politician, you were on the national level in some way running for president or something. Now there's like all these micro, you know, like you could be like a local councilman or something and you have this online following or whatever. You're just like more famous than you've ever been. Like, I mean, if you could say something crazy. That'll get you definitely a primetime spot on Fox News for eight right. minutes, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, like, I think probably Lauren, Lauren Boebert is like the fucking poster child for that. Well, she's you a know? great example, too, of somebody who only got elected because of social media. Like, you only, like, you could, and I mean, yeah, Trump was the kind of the test case for this where, like, he tweeted his way into the presidency. Like, you can Fox just do that yeah. now. Like, you can just, yeah. it's a huge difference in what, what things used to be. Mm-hmm. And it is, and he was obviously much more famous because he was on, you know, TV and all that for years. But it was just, yeah, like it, it is kind of insane. This this new microcosms of not just celebrity, but how you can kind of make yourself into a, a mythical figure in some ways. Uh, it's really, I'm fascinated by that, and I guess it's just the consequence of putting yourself out there. This is like you said, this is how people consume media now. This is how people whether it's books, whether it's movies, whether it's politics, you know, news, like this is just how people consume it now. So you can build a career off of just tweeting about articles or doing little TikToks with the green screen behind you, you know, doing like kind of commentary on an article that came out that day or something. And now all of a sudden you're a critic. Now all of a sudden you're a cultural critic with like, you know, a couple hundred thousand followers on TikTok and you can start monetizing like... Do you, do you put your like TikToks or reels or whatever? Do you make them on TikTok first, and then and that's where the words come up on the screen and shit, and then you just put that on all your other platforms? I make them all just on my computer, but I do. 
Uh, and then I and then I post them to all the things, but it is it's frustrating sometimes because each social media site has their own kind of preferences for, you know, if you're longer than a minute, well, it's hard to get it up on YouTube Shorts. That if you're longer than a minute, you're not getting up on Shorts. And then if you're a, a less than a minute, TikTok likes that better. The algorithm likes it when it's like 30 seconds to a minute. If you're doing five 10 minute videos, I think TikTok's limit is like 10 minutes. You can't really do more than a 10 minute video. Yeah. Uh, do you use program to edit yeah, those? Yeah, I just use uh, the free uh, ClipChamp on Microsoft. For, right. uh, and their uh, their their subtitles are not great, but at least it's not it's free, so I don't have to pay for like a software to do that. Uh, yeah, I was gonna um, use this thing that was like twenty bucks a month. Can't those are better. You have more tools with things like that, yeah. and it's more control. And if you're getting play, I could see, I could justify maybe spending $20 a month on something that's like more professional software. Because I was hiring um, chicks in the Philippines to do it. Really? Because yeah. I keep them like five bucks and they would make like, um, I don't know, like 10 or 12 like clips. But like I was having to go back and like fix all of their shit because their English isn't great. Right. Like when they're talking to you, their English seems great. And then like you get them on a video call and you're like, oh shit, they have no idea. I'm like, I, I'm not I'm not trying to be a dick, but like I'm a writer. So I kind of need to be somewhat literate. <laughs> like I can't just have you guess like how this is going. So that sucks. Yeah, and it's a difference in terms of like, there's always a difference between reading and writing and speaking too. So if you can speak and understand the language, that's one thing. Can you write it? You know, like that's another like level. And then reading it, it's another level too. Yeah, for real. Do you feel like you get more um, engagement from your shorts than you do from your podcast? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I got to get on that, dude. Because um, shorts is what YouTube's prioritizing right now. So, yeah. like, it's kind of crazy. Like, I don't know. And I don't really have a large following on any of those platforms. So it's always interesting to see which one will take off or which one won't, you know? What's the biggest platform for you? Uh, Twitter is the line. I have the most followers on stuff on that. Um, and that's probably just because I use it the most. Uh, but in terms of like the stuff that gets spread around like YouTube, uh, spreads it around. If you hit with something, it definitely spreads it around more. Uh, I've seen some stuff where like people that make their living doing stuff like this, where they said the big three are YouTube shorts, Facebook fan pages, and then TikTok videos. Wow. Those are going to get you the most play, at least in terms of the social media. And that's probably more to do with the user bases. They just, those have like the largest user bases for all the platforms, even compared to like Instagram. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy, man. It's a, it's a crap shoot too, because this is one of those weird fields. I feel like where you, you know, following count, it matters, but it doesn't really matter. You know, like what, like you can do it in other ways. Like, for example, like a good way to get followers on like all these other social media pages is if you're just publishing in magazines, you know, if you're just pitching to even like smaller online magazines, well, every time you publish something, you'll gain a few, like a couple, you know, you'll get a little rise in engagement and follower count and all that. And I'm not, I've never had anything go like, you know, viral really. Uh, so like a lot of views to me would be like a thousand or something, you know, like that's not... Uh, and I know that's that's small potatoes compared to most people. Yeah. But like it's and, you know, I always say like it's and you you understand this because like when you're building it from scratch, like nobody knows who I am. Like nobody knows who I am. They don't know what I do. They don't know even my positions. You know, people just assume your positions on things or whatever. And like you said, it's, mostly, it's my fault too because if you're just kind of firing off whatever on a Twitter or something, then people will just assume. But like, it's like, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of weird. And then it gets into, like you said, the... the Have you had any like, like bad kickback on anything? 
occasionally. Yeah, sure. Oh, dude, you know what I say. You know I have. <laughs> the shit that I say, yeah. Uh, yeah, for me to say something like, eh, I don't buy the Me Too stuff or something. I mean, that can just... But even then, nobody knows who I am. So it's not even like that big of a kickback. It's just, it feels bigger than it is because it's just, that's what you're seeing, you know, like negative reactions. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy too, because even on YouTube, like I don't even put up like videos of myself, like I don't release video podcasts, you know? So it's just kind of like non video videos where it's just kind of like the podcast recording with the artwork, like the yeah. kind of episode artwork. Uh, and I just, I don't want to do video. It's just another editing thing that I have to do. Maybe if I got, if the podcast took off to the point where it's paying for itself, I might be able to stomach doing video too, but I just, you know, the backgrounds, the sets, like I just, I don't want to deal with all that shit. Like the editing, the video editing is insane compared to audio editing. Yeah. And that's why all those big podcasts just have like a team of people that like do the video editing for them and cut the clips and put them up there just because that's just, that's the only way you can really do it. Like it takes all your time otherwise. All, all your time, dude. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's, and then if you're trying to write too, you know, you're still trying to keep the writing going. You're still trying to, it's brutal out there, man. I mean, it's brutal. And the wheel like, of the world is an unforgiving place. I didn't start with YouTube. Like, I don't know if I would have even gone YouTube, but I, all, like a lot of this kind of happened by accident. Right. But YouTube is like my, that's my candy. You know, that's like where most of my shit comes from. So I just have to kind of swallow it. <clears throat> yeah. That it's fucking time. Consuming. And it's a small niche. Like you're doing poetry. Okay. Well that's, that limits the reach, you know, like that limits, like even, I think the reason everybody does political commentary now kind of mixed with stuff is because that gets you more play, you know, that gets you a wider reach and, you know, you don't really have to be an expert in anything. You, you just give out your opinion on something. You know, you just, same with the dating discourse. You don't really have to be an expert. You can just kind of give your two cents. And if, you know, and of course, if it's a normal thing you're saying, there's going to be a huge chunk of people that agree with it and push that like, you know. So, yeah, we're all kind of at mercy for the algorithm. That's why I'm always fascinated. I would love to talk to somebody that's more in the know in the industry because it's like, you know, what are the numbers looking like for something like that? Like, and I, I know they're not huge, but like, you know, what are you gauging these marketing materials on? Cause I know you're not gauging it on nothing. You know, that would be disastrous. You're gauging it on something, you know, is it like the play on TikTok? Is it like, yeah. And I mean, there's, it's always interesting too, where like, you know, I'll say something and it'll make people bristle and I'll lose some followers or whatever it is. And then they come crawling back, you know, like kind of like a couple months later, you know, whatever, I'll say something else. They're like, yeah, wait, 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 wait why did I unfollow that guy? You know, like, why did I, <laughs> and I, it's interesting to see that happen. Uh, I mean, people have short memories now too. Like I always say that the most interesting part about social media is this is the age of endless pivot. Like, oh, you got famous or big following do saying some ridiculous shit online. Well, that turned out to be false. Well, who cares? Now you can just pivot and just do whatever you want. Oh, you want to talk about wine? Well, you just do that now. And like nobody, everybody just forgets within a couple months, you know, like they call it the memory hole online, but like we've always done this as humans, but like, it's just like weird to see splared out on the timeline, you know? Yeah. It's just things happen so much faster now. And like the second you fuck up, if you just hold your breath, someone else will fuck up and take everyone's attention. Yeah, and I've seen a few like PR firms that understand social media. See, the problem initially was a lot of these PR firms didn't understand uh, how this how the algorithm was was working. But now I've seen a lot of them kind of recommend to people just keep posting through it. Like if shit's blowing up, like just keep doing it because they're going to forget within 24 hours, depending on what it is, you know, like if it's something really crazy, like, you know, maybe not, but and they always say that they look at Donald Trump, like he's the king of this, like, you know, like just, oh, he says something crazy. Well, yeah. now he just said something else crazy and everybody forgot about the previous, yeah. you know, like you just keep going and it just grows the engagement because it is entertainment. Like it's gotten to the point where people giving commentary on 
politics or literature or anything is entertainment now. Like it's a form of watching a TV show. There's drama on the timeline. There's these two people are beefing, you know, like, and they're going back and forth and everybody's watching kind of like a schoolyard fight. Yeah. It's, uh, and that's changed the dynamic. But yeah, man, I mean, you know, the growth, I always, I mean, my goal is to grow this so that I could make it my job, but, uh, I'm in a niche field and it's growing. It's slow that, you know, it's a slow growth thing. You build that audience one person at a time. You know, I started with zero <laughs> and now you're building, you know, you build slowly, slowly, slowly. And I yep. think the algorithm takes that into account too. I've heard things about when you're at a certain follower ratio, then your stuff gets boosted, you know, because the, the algorithm takes that into account. Uh, and it has to do with money too. Like if you're generating, like, for instance, like, if I was just going off of my ad revenue, I wouldn't get boosted as much as I do. But because I have a very high membership count compared to what my views are, right? and my membership tiers are pretty high for YouTube standards, um, like, my shit gets pushed harder because the actual money YouTube makes off of my shit, even though it's not as viral as other people's shit is enough for them to go, Oh, we should continue to push this. Yeah. And if there's a base already built in like subscribers to a channel or members of a channel now that they do that, like they'll be like, if it starts clicking, they'll push it. But even that, like I've had, it's interesting to see too when you, I think it age of the account comes into play and how much content you have. Like I'll see like there are a couple episodes that do better than others on YouTube or something. And like, you know, those are two years old at this point almost. And they're still accumulating views and like likes and comments and things. And then you all of a sudden it'll take off. You'll get like, you know, and I'm not even talking big numbers. You'll get like 45 new views or something in a day. And it's like, whoa, that's like a two-year-old video or two-year-old post. Yeah. So we're all at mercy for that. And it's, I, I, I like that. I think we we're kind of getting over it a little bit where like at least the shock of it, you know, like it took 10 years where like people didn't understand that people would just say things, you know? So every time somebody just said something, everybody would freak out. But now we're kind of exhausted with that. And we're like, ah, oh, who cares? You know, just ignore it and stuff. It's not as huge of a controversy as it used to be. And uh, so that's changing it too. So you can't get, I mean, you still can in a lot of ways get away with just saying crazy shit and mm-hmm. getting people to click. Uh, but even the newspapers and stuff, like they're they're having to kind of walk back some of the most extreme clickbaity stuff because people recognize it now. And they're like, ah, you know, who cares? Uh, I don't know. We're all at the mercy of this kind of these tech conglomerates. And they determine how much you make. They determine how it gets boosted, who. So it's not organic, you know, like there's no neutrality to it. Um, yeah, there's like a big thing in some of the circles I hang out, you know, people always claim to be like shadow banned or something. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how true that is. Uh, I think there's also like a sense of uh, like social credit if yeah. you've been shadow banned. Yeah. Like, oh, you're important enough to ban? Oh, let me start paying attention to you more. Right, or I'm dangerous, or I'm... They don't want you to see this. It's forbidden. Again, the forbidden, right? It's still that human element. Like, oh, that's forbidden. But really, when you look at it, like the stuff that does the best is just if you're putting out interesting stuff, people will find it eventually, you know, even if it takes a while. But I mean, you know, I'm in no position to give advice on stuff like that because I haven't even built it to a point where it's it's sustaining and it's self-sustaining at this point where like it doesn't cost me anything now. I make enough from it to not lose money, but like it's also like, you know, I'm not getting paid like really. I'm not, you know, making any kind of like income off of it. And I do it cheaply. Like I, I the same reason I do it through Skype here is because now I don't have to pay like, you know, $40 a month zoom subscription if i do it off skype you know yeah and maybe i I would switch to zoom if i was making more money yeah yeah um like i pay for zoom and 
every month when I see it come out, I'm like, why am I paying for this? <laughs> well, and since, and since you do video more, it makes more sense, though, where, like, you get more tools. Like, Microsoft, this free version of Skype doesn't give you any tools to, like, record and edit the stuff decently. Like, I do as an external software yeah. to record because it just doesn't work as well. Um, okay, so back to Mr. Bukowski here. Let's go. One of the poems that's like one of my favorite ones in here. Um, and it's also probably one of his best late period things. Um, but it also does two things that I think, whether or not it was intentional, that he was kind of famous for. Um, and it's the poem Dinosauria We. And um, the two things that this does is, <clears throat> one, it does that whole thing where he is putting himself and the reader as peers. Like, that they're both going through the same thing. Okay. And the second thing is, and I don't know if he knew that this is something he did, but if you read a lot of his stuff, you see it all the time. But this is basically a list poem. And um, I don't know when those got popular, <clears throat> but so much of his stuff is a list poem. And this poem is just page after page of like a list of metaphors, like a list of similes. You know what I'm saying? And, um, like, do you care if I read this? No, go for it, yeah. Okay. Um, let me see here. Page 520 in the book, listeners. Yeah. Um, let me see. So, <clears throat> Dinosauria we. Okay. Born into, or born like this, into this, as the chalk face smiles, as Mr. Death laughs, as the elevators break, as political landscapes dissolve, as the supermarket bag boy holds a college degree, as the oily fish spit out their oily prey, as the sun is masked, we are born like this, into this, into these carefully mad wars, into the sight of broken factory windows of emptiness into bars where people no longer speak to each other, into fistfights that end as shootings and kill, or shootings and knifings. Born into this, into hospitals where, or born into hospitals, into hospitals which are so expensive that it's cheaper to die. <sighs> into lawyers who charge so much it's cheaper to plead guilty. Into a country where the jails are full and the madhouse is closed into a place where the masses elevate fools into rich heroes. Born into this, walking and living through this, dying because of this, muted because of this, castrated, debauched, disinherited, because of this, fooled by this, used by this, pissed on by this, made crazy and sick by this, made violent, made inhuman by this, the heart is blackened. The fingers reach for the throat, the gun, the knife, the bomb. The fingers reach toward an unresponsive God. The fingers reach for the bottle, the pill, the powder. We are born into this sorrowful deadliness. We are born into a government 60 years in debt that soon will be unable to even pay the interest on that debt. And the banks will burn. Money will be useless. There will be open and unpunished murder in the streets. It will be guns and roving mobs. Land will be useless. Food will become a diminishing return. Nuclear power will be taken over by the many. Explosions will continually shake the earth. Radiated robot men will stalk each other. The rich and the chosen will watch from space platforms. Dante's Inferno will be made to look like a children's playground. The sun will not be seen, and it will always be night. Trees will die. All vegetation will die. Radiated men will eat the flesh of radiated men. 
the sea will be poisoned, the lakes and rivers will vanish, rain will be the new gold, the rotting bodies of men and animals will sink in the dark wind, the last few survivors will be overtaken by new and hideous diseases, and the space platforms will be destroyed by attrition, the petering out of supplies, the natural effect of general decay. And there will be the most beautiful silence ever heard, born out of that, the sun still hidden there, awaiting the next chapter. The so, extinction, yeah. Um, just, I mean, that thing is fucking timeless as ever. Like, Jesus fucking Christ. But um, just the way he goes down and he will just list, 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 list thing after thing after thing and when he does it he does it in uh this is happening to me and you so he has done that through tons of his work but i think that is the best example of um i don't know just the way he does that and that is just an amazing piece you know i just love it and the impl implication that, like, we will go the way of the dinosaurs eventually, right? Like, this kind of... That which is a constantly theme, right? Like, the kind of... A theme in his work is kind of disgust at humanity, uh, and maybe himself to some extent, because that's the same thing, really. Uh, and we're born like this, into this, right? Like, the kind of... The kind of... We have no... There's so many things that we have no control over. Yeah, Totally. We, we try to pretend we do. I think that's why people are obsessed with politics too. At least, you know, they're, they're less obsessed now. Like I think with the, to be fair with the trends, we're becoming out of this political obsession that we've lived through the last kind of 10 years. But it's like, because it's an attempt, it's a desperate attempt to kind of control all these things that we really can't, you know, people are always going to be fucking and fighting, you know, in the, in between here about all kinds of different things and we pretend that we can control it because sometimes we can with certain things, but like we can't control everything with it. And it's maybe people are getting disillusioned where we, we thought we could for a while. And it's like, well, actually this, these kind of timeless poem is actually the reality. Whereas, you know, what does he say about it even here? Right. Like the political kind of dissolving into uh, the jails are full. The madhouse is closed, you know, it's even more like, astute about the time because that was when Reagan closed the government um, madhouses right. and that I like in California at least this is when Reagan was governor um, he closed them down and um, like this privatized them and um, the people the privatization was like oh we can make more money on the land than we can like with all this shit and so that's why the homeless problem fucking <clears throat> what it is here you it's know been growing in sense yeah 80s because like in the 80s when you saw homeless people the homeless people were homeless because they were crazy and they got kicked out of the fucking asylums now when you see homeless people it's mainly motherfuckers who like oh shit i thought i had a job and then i didn't <laughs> yeah so it's a little different made crazy and sick by this made violent made inhumane by this and he has a lot of things about this we kind of just like slights at like the government like uh or or yeah just uh, the broaden that i guess humanity or something or, or civilization maybe and that's always been a theme in literature right like literature has always tried to critique or point out absurdities or you know, science fiction is always a great humor trick in science fiction is to point out how absurd kind of, you know, if an alien were to look at our life and our lifestyle on the planet and stuff, what would they think? Like, how foreign it would be. Like, we all go to work and we sip this, like, brown bitter liquid, you know, coffee and get in these little death trap boxes and drive, you know, 60 miles an hour to work in the morning. And, like, that would be so strange to somebody that doesn't, see it that way or never live that yeah. way or and i think too another thing if we're going to talk political about him is he lived through fdr you know right. he's old so yeah he saw what the depression did to people 
He saw how Frankie pulled the country out of it for good or for bad, how it was done. But like FDR was the closest thing to a socialist government that America ever fucking had. And he saw that and then saw the capitalism boom of the eighties. You know what I'm saying? And he's this is a man dying. You know what I'm saying? Like, this was, like, late shit. Like, I think this is in Last Night of Earth poems. So this is, like, just a few years before he died. So it's, like, I don't even know, dude. Like, to see that much time go by and, like, being able to juggle it and judge it, like, in the, what do you call it, the... um just like being able to look back and see how things have changed. Like that's one of those, I don't know what it's called, but like when a writer writes like the piece where they look back at their life and um, judge humanity based off of the life that they've led, like there's got to be a name for that. Like it's some type of poem or something. I don't know. Um, it's no country for old men. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. It's his men for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, yeah, tale as old as time. Cause like you, you outgrow the world that you grew up in no longer exists and that's inevitable. Right. And then there's a couple different ways you could approach that. I bet some things are better. Some things are worse, but like, it's still like, it doesn't exist anymore regardless. So like, you know, you could mourn that. And I think a lot of writers as they age, they do. Um, I saw this when I did Charles Simic's book too, one of his more recent ones with, uh, he was doing that and his like later stuff that came out 2017, you know, he's in his eighties now, you know, and like he's seen looking back at the things that used to be there, even like a boarded up library that he used to go to, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago and just seeing it board up and decay. Now that's something, you know, that affects, I think there's an inherent romanticism to human beings too, is this is why we love animals. This is why we want to be caretakers and stewards and stuff. Because when I see like a boarded up factory or, you know, just rusting to shit out there in the middle of middle America, my instinct yeah. is to romanticize it, is to just go, man, why did we let that happen? You know, why did we let this decay? Why did we let this glorious American town that was based around this just fall into ash? You know, we we did that. Like, we, we could have prevented it, uh, and maybe we couldn't have, but, like, that's just the instinct we have is to romanticize. And I think that's why people look back with rose-colored glasses. Maybe that's a survival mechanism, you know, in human beings to look back at something and long or be nostalgic for it, or maybe overlook some of the more awful stuff. I don't know. I mean, because well, if without that, we would be so doomed and depressed, maybe, you yeah. know, like, I think it's even the, the opposite way too. Cause like I go back to my hometown and I don't even fucking recognize it right? because all corporate like built up, fucking shit the only thing i saw that was the same was the carl's jr in the carl's jr parking lot right and i like that's right on the edge of town and i fucking went into there and i'm like this is the only thing that looks familiar i can't fucking do this like i cannot go back to this town that looks a hundred times different and act like everything's okay and right. i fucking turned around and i fucking left it's not the same yeah but it's fucking weird like you expect it to be how it was and then when you see what like you said whether it's good or bad it's different yeah and that's terrifying and it makes you feel the age and it makes you feel the change and you yeah. know like like it's people human beings we don't like it even animals don't like it you know like we don't like when something's different you know we like the habits and routines of things things staying Imagine. steady yeah. Imagine rolling over in the morning and looking at your wife and she has a different face. Right. Yeah. It, whether it's a better face or a worse face, it would still shock the fucking shit out of you. You know, like it's fucking crazy. That is no country for old men. Yeah. Yates, he said it a hundred years ago. Yeah. When he was in his sixties, just kind of looking back. That is no country for old men. 
And I think that's what that line means, right? Like that's what it means is that it has moved on and now, you know, the country that you thought was there or the city or whatever it is, the local shop that you used to go to just isn't there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. For and now real. it's, you have, and it feels like you have no place. Like you're displaced all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, dude, this, this poem, Sunday lunch at the Holy mission, page 107 with Bukowski. We'd, uh, this was one where I was just like, I think this is a good one to read just because it uh, does the expression and all that. The expression and just kind of like why Bukowski is so beloved by these things. Like just kind of what he manages to capture as I've been struggling to say this whole fucking time where he said the, this poem, he got knifed in broad daylight, came up the street, holding his hands over his gut, dripping red on the pavement. Nobody waiting in line left their place to help him. He made it to the mission doorway, collapsed in the lobby where the desk clerk screamed, Hey, you son of a bitch, what are you doing? Then he called an ambulance, but the man was dead when they got there. The police came and circled the spots of blood on the pavement with white chalk, photographed everything, then asked the men waiting for their Sunday meal if they had seen anything, if they knew anything. They all said no to both. While the police strutted in their uniforms and the others finally loaded the body into an ambulance, Afterwards, the homeless men rolled cigarettes as they waited for their meal, talking about the action, blowing farts and smoke, enjoying the sun, feeling quite like celebrities. <laughs> and I just think that this kind of, the expression is the comparison, right? Like the artistic expression is in the comparison to celebrities, right? This yeah. homeless guy getting knife, nobody knows why comes up to like the whole the little like holy mission here sunday lunch at the holy mission and everyone's like oh what's going on with this guy hey wait a minute what are you doing here and the guy's literally just dying and then everybody just moves on this guy's dead and then they're like oh they're asking us questions we're celebrities like that's what he captures like this kind of i don't want to say like the everyday kind of intricacies of life but it is that you know yeah, for real. And these homeless people that were all of a sudden like, oh, did you guys see anything? Yeah, they're being interviewed. They're fucking important all of a sudden. Right. It's kind of like, yeah, like podcasting or something. All of a sudden people are interested in what you have to say. You're like, wait a minute, how did this happen? Like, But it's just how it always happens, I guess. Yeah. You just make yourself something like this. Come on for it. <laughs> Oh, shit. God, there's so many good ones in here, dude. I know, man. Well, that's why I like it, because it is kind of like the greatest hits with this. Uh... Like, one of my favorite poems ever, like if we're talking about especially like the really short ones, is art. And um, I actually <clears throat> have this printed out on my desk. I like Modge Podged it on my desk, but it's... Um, as the spirit wanes, the form appears. And um, I just think that goes into um, like when people don't feel it anymore, like when these great poets don't feel it anymore, they start to lean more towards form because at least that's like a outline for how to do the shit. Yeah. It's a scaffolding uh, you can follow. Yeah. To construct it instead of following the spirit of it or Yeah. The winds the whims of the wind and the If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. Can you paint with all the colors of the 
of the wind, Pocahontas. <laughs> yeah, like the tragedy of the leaves is in here. The genius of the crowd is in here. Dude, I want to talk about the genius of the crowd. Is that one of your favorites? Yeah, hit it, dude. Yeah, yeah, that's one of mine too, dude. 165 <clears throat> in the book, listeners. And this one is one that I think is timeless. It's a little bit long, but uh, it's a lot of lot of great lines in here. And uh, again, it's kind of listy. Yeah, like a thing, dude. Yeah. And the kind of capitalization he messes with the kind of capitalizing yeah. certain words for emphasis in this one, which he doesn't do very often. People that know yeah. this, he's he he usually doesn't even use capitals. But the genius of the crowd, and I think this one is timely for now too. Uh, but this, there is enough treachery, hatred, violence, absurdity in the average human being to supply any given army on any given day. And the best at murder are those who preach against it. And the best at hate are those who preach love. And the best at war, finally, are those who preach peace. Those who preach God need God. Those who preach peace do not have peace. Those who preach love do not have love. Beware the preachers. Beware the knowers. Beware those who, who are always reading books. <laughs> Beware those who either detest poverty or are proud of it. Beware those quick to praise, for they need praise in return. Beware those quick to censure. They are afraid of what they do not know. Beware those who seek constant crowds. They are nothing alone. Beware the average man, the average woman. Beware their love. Their love is average, seeks average. But there is genius in their hatred. There is enough genius in their hatred to kill you, to kill anybody. Not wanting solitude, not understanding solitude, they will attempt to destroy anything that differs from their own. Not being able to create art, they will not understand art. They will consider their failure as creators, only as a failure of the world. Not being able to love fully, they will believe your love incomplete. And then they will hate you. And their hatred will be perfect, like a shining diamond, like a knife, like a mountain, like a tiger, like hemlock, their finest art. And when I read this, I was just like, oh, this is why people love Bukowski. This is why people resonate with Bukowski at every level. And yeah. I think this is also why he gets a little hatred from from the more like kind of academy side of, of, of art of art and poetry. Cause think of how much kind of wisdom is in this, like how much knowledge is in this. Yeah. He's talking like fucking like the art of war, you right. know, like he's more of a philosopher than an artist here, but doing it artistically. And there's so many bangers beware those who either detest poverty or who are proud of it. Like, yeah, totally. like, where it's this yeah. kind of, <clears throat> and that's something like, in art too. And I know you know this, like in art where like people, especially if they came from money or if they have family money or whatever, people will pretend that they don't, or they'll pretend to be like poorer than they are because that's almost considered some type of virtue. You know, you had it harder than others. Therefore, you know, yeah. Um, the one thing about this poem that like always like pisses me off, let's say, is that I feel like the end of this poem, and he does this a lot, especially during this period, where he will end a poem in a way where it's like, okay, I wrote this whole poem for random motherfuckers, like average fucking Joes, but I'm going to throw some stuff at the end of this to make academia think there's more to me. So when he says like a mountain, like a tiger, like hemlock. Like, I feel like that's just for the academics. Yeah. Like, and he didn't need to put that in there, but he put that in there to try to get that attention. But that's just me picking on him. But like, <laughs> <clears throat> he does that a lot. Like he will end a poem in like these weird lofty similes I think that this is taking a lot of swipes at academics too with like, oh, yeah, with the not being able to love fully, they will believe your love incomplete and then they will hate you. <laughs> where like, and you see this a lot where it's, oh, it's like this kind of purity. You see it in politics, you see it in art, you see it in this kind of 
oh, well, that's not the true, you know, it's kind of like the no true Scotsman fallacy. Well, no true artist would think of it that way or no true artist would write this way or something. And it just, yeah, we're like not being able to love fully. They will believe your love incomplete, your love of the yeah. art, your love of the craft, you know. Well, the thing here is that like I think would really get in the craw of a lot of motherfuckers <sighs> is he, is he saying that he's the genius of the crowd <laughs> or making fun of the people who think they are the geniuses of the crowd. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like who the like who does he think he fucking is? Like, this whole thing is a fucking swipe. It fucking everybody from military leaders and political leaders to fucking religious leaders to fucking other poets. You know, yeah. like this whole thing is a big fuck you. And then at the end of it, they need to figure out, oh, my God, does he think he's a genius and I'm a piece of shit? <laughs> like, Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, beware classic. those quick to praise for they need praise in return. And it almost is like a cut like a. He's going back to kind of the Christian Beatitudes too, right? Like, uh, blessed is the meek for they shall inherit the, you know, like kind of beware those quick to praise. <laughs> is he the Christ? Yeah. Like, is he like anointed himself the Messiah in this fucking poem? You know, it's like, it's fucking hysterical. No, yeah. that's great. One that like comes up a lot. Um, <clears throat> the tragedy of the leaves, I'll just read real quick here too. Um, this is like one of his more early poems that were amazing. <clears throat> I awakened to the dryness of, and the ferns were dead. The potted plants yellow as corn. My woman was gone and the empty bottles bled or the empty bottles like bled corpses surrounded me with their uselessness. The sun was still good, though, and my landlady's note cracked in fine and undemanding yellowness. What was needed now was a good comedian, ancient style, a jester with jokes upon absurd pain. Pain is absurd because it exists. Nothing more. I, share, I shaved carefully with an old razor, and the man who had once been young and said to have, to have genius... But that's the tragedy of the leaves, the dead ferns, the dead plants. And I walked into the dark hall where the landlady stood, execrating and final, sending me to hell, waving her fat, sweaty arms and screaming for rent because the world had failed us both. That's a fucking banger, dude. Oh, yeah. But here he said, like, the man who had been young and said to have genius. <laughs> so I guess I guess he is the genius of the crowd. Oh, my God. And the play on it, too, right? So if the, if the cliche is the madness of the crowd, he's yeah. actually the genius of the crowd. And that, I think, the kind of fuck you attitude, too. That's why people love him. This is why he's yeah. one of the biggest most influential, most imitated writers ever to live. And seriously, like, um, <clears throat> like judging the amount of time that has passed from when your relationship ends to the plants are dead and there's bottles all over the place. It like shows like how long the tragedy has been going on. And now it's like, shit's hitting the fan because now he actually has to pay the rent like enough time has gone by that he hasn't been doing shit other than drinking and watching the plants die yeah. brilliant yeah that's great and i like um, the gold in your eye this is the last one i had with uh and i don't we don't have to read all of this but i just think the last couple stanzas here where he's talking about like how he's kind of made it you know driving his BMW and getting his American Express card from the bank. How about halfway here? Can I read to the end? It says, On the way, I further decided to write a poem about the whole thing, the BMW, the bank, the gold card, just to piss off the critics, the writers, the readers, who much preferred the old poems about me, sleeping on park benches while freezing and dying of cheap wine and malnutrition. 
This poem is for those who think that a man can only be a creative genius at the very edge, even though they never had the guts to try it. Yep. That's awesome. And the fuck the, you. Yeah, the fuck you yeah. poem. Yeah. The I, I'm not gonna read it, but the next poem in here too, the great writer, is fucking hysterical. And um I, I, I don't fucking know. Um I, like there's so many that I would read, but there's only one that um I think that I need to go especially if we're at the end of that especially that being like death once more death is great too but um uh where is it um the bluebird did you have that one marked at oh all? yeah oh yeah yeah classic so, yeah and the, and this one just shows him and like how he is like if anyone ever wanted to know like who he was, like really, like this is probably the closest thing you'll ever get to it. Um, there's a blue bird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay in there. I'm not going to let anybody see you. There's a blue bird in my heart that wants to get out, but I pour whiskey on him and inhale cigarette smoke. And the whores and the bartenders and the grocery clerks never know that he's there. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay down. Do you want to mess me up? You want me or you want to screw up the works? You want to blow my book sales in Europe? There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too clever. I only let him out at night sometimes when everyone's asleep. I say, I know that you're there. Don't be so don't be sad. Then I put him back, but he's singing a little in there. I haven't quite let him die, and we will sleep like that, or we will sleep together like that with our secret pact, and it's nice enough to make a man weep, but I don't weep. Do you? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's just, um, yeah. The soul right or we could get like like the poetic soul like the bluebird right this little nice little pretty songbird drowned like with whiskey yeah like he's uh he wants to be like a sweet caring compassionate man but he can't because if he is he'll fucking the world will kill him. And now that he's rich from fucking being an amazing motherfucker, if anyone were to know how he really was, they would blow his book sales in Europe. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. It's like what we were talking about where there's that, there's the public Charles Bukowski and then there's the actual Mm -hmm. Charles Bukowski. There's the persona and then there's the actual person because he's a human, right? There's a couple times in this book, and he does this in all his books, but since this is like the greatest hits where he just says, you know, I do have feelings, you know, right? That's that line where he's just like, you know, everybody thinks I'm just this insensitive prick that hates everything because he writes about that. But then it's also like, you know, that's only a sometimes feeling for everybody, you know? That's only a sometimes where like you still have the normal range of human emotions, unless you're like a psychopath, you know, you have the normal range where, yeah, yeah, sometimes you're sad. Sometimes you're really sentimental and weepy and, you know, you want to weep about the beauty that's being choked out. Like I want to weep for an abandoned factory or something like I want to weep for you know, that, that, that old store I used to go into or whatever that isn't there anymore. I want to, yeah. And I always say this is like, I think this is understudied for a particularly kind of writers that have this reputation. So male writers that have this reputation of kind of like the hard ass, you know, hooker fucking whiskey yeah. alcoholics kind of there's a, an immense sensitivity behind a lot of that. I feel like that isn't talked about a lot where this kind of, I say the same thing for emo music. Cause I'm kind of, you know, grew up in the emo era where like that was incredibly sensitive. Like it was incredibly tender. There was so much tenderness to even a lot of Bukowski stuff where like 
it's this hard exterior, but there, there is that kind of tenderness underneath. Because I feel like the only way you can really write about that hard ass shit is if you can juxtapose it with you being that type of person. Right. I mean, shit, just like coming from experience. Like, I feel like that's the only way you can do it, you know? And I always, I think of, I think maybe it's because of the reputational costs, like in this poem too, where like, if you are too sensitive as a man, it makes you vulnerable. Like you are now vulnerable to the world, taking advantage of you in certain ways. And I always think about this because I played sports in high school and stuff. You know, I wasn't really good enough to play in college or anything, but it was just like the people are always like, oh, men should show emotions. I'm like, you ever been in a locker room like where you just lost the big game? Like everyone is crying. Like everyone is crying, like on each other's shoulders, like kind of thing. And it's just this very tender, like we lost, like we, we tried really hard and we didn't do it. Like, you know, and everybody feel, you see it, you know, professional players, it's more obvious because they put even more work into it, you know, at that level, like the teams that loses the Super Bowl or something, they're all in tears before, as the confetti falls around them. Like they're in tears because they put everything into this and they didn't get it. And like, you want to see a vulnerable man, (laughs) like see him after that. Like he's going to be pretty fucking vulnerable. Uh, you know, and then you have to go do press conferences and people are asking you and all that kind of shit. And it's kind of, that tears you up. That little bluebird is in there for all of us in this. And I think that's another reason people like Bukowski is particularly women. You know, they're drawn to that because he's letting out this kind of sensitive side, but he's, he's burying it in these kind of almost even fictionalized, like we said, like kind of benders or, or, or hooker fests or whatever, you know. Dude, like, <clears throat> like this is like kind of outside of the scope of the podcast probably. Yeah. but um like it's weird to see parallels because like like obviously especially since i've been writing poetry people compare me to him all the fucking time like that's just whatever but it's weird when things happen in my life that I've read about already. Right. It makes me feel like I'm like reading like the future kind of thing, if that makes any sense. And I know one of the things that he has said a lot. And then my ex said that to me, like basically right before she left was, um, like you say all this stuff in your poems and you say all this like wonderful stuff, but then when we're together, you don't say that, like, you don't talk like that. You don't say these wonderful things. And, um, he's like, well, I'm saving it for the fucking, the typer, you know? Yeah. And it's a hundred percent fucking true. And even if I'm like going to therapy, like seeing a therapist and shit, if I'm seeing my therapist a lot, like I don't have as much stuff to write because that writing is, like exercising the demons, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. when you give that to your therapist, you have less for the fucking typer or the fucking computer, you know what I'm saying? And, um, I don't know. So like, I've been kind of, I'm not trying to make this about me, but I'm turning this into a fucking therapy session, <sighs> but doing this thing where like, I'm starting to see patterns that I've read about in his life and seen them act out in my life. And it's freaking me out and making me step back and not do anything. And, um, like I am not at all as productive as I was a year ago because like I've been freaking the fuck out seeing these things happen and it's fucking weird. Yeah. Like just in terms of, of, and I guess there's some universalism to that too, right? Where we go to literature and art for wisdom in yep. life and other things. And it's a tale, you know, the tale as old as time, right? Like the kind of, we're not the first men on planet earth to be dealing with this kind of thing. Uh, we're not going to be the last. And it's a matter of, you know, capturing that 
I said that is no country for old men, right? Like that. Why is that so universal? Why is that so? Well, and it makes you feel stupid too, because yeah. you read about someone's failures and how they fuck their life up. And then with you not even fucking knowing you're doing the exact same thing, you watch yourself do something that you've already read about. Right. And then like, okay, well, I just need to go a few more pages up ahead to find out how this ends. Right. And it's like, no, like, it's going to be different, but you'll keep seeing the same themes and the same patterns. And it's like, good fucking God, dude. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, it's almost, I wonder if that's more like biologically ingrained in, in men, especially too, was like we said that the vulnerability makes you vulnerable or like being more sensitive or expressing yourself in the art. If you were to do that in everyday life, you know, like it's almost a joke. Like you, it does hurt you in a way, like you're more vulnerable to being hurt by the world, being taken mm -hmm. advantage of. Uh, I'm always, I'm, especially when I was younger, I'm less so now, but I was always, I'm always shocked because I'm naive. Like I'm naive a lot of times. I'm like, how could people be so mean, like so cruel? Like, how can you do that? Like, it's not even in me to do that to people. Like, you know, like it fills me with like feelings of dread or something to like do that. Uh, I guess we're all capable of it, but it's just like. I say like, you know, when you're sensitive, like you are more vulnerable to, to the worst ups and downs of life, you know, like in these kind of artists, especially. That's why I always, I'm fascinated. I wish people would study it more. Maybe it's going to be up to me to do that kind of stuff because nobody else is doing it, but just kind of, I always say this with certain types of music, even like the Gen X music, right? Like in the nineties and like it was about these kind of men shouting, you know, very kind of, I love you, baby type of things. This streetcar named desire Stanley, this brash, arrogant, smashing the dishes against the wall. And at the end he's screaming for her at the street crying, like, don't you ever leave me, baby, you know, like, and it fills you with that. Oh, like it makes me choked up just thinking about it because it is like it, it captures something that that I don't know that men are always kind of going. And I mean, women, too. I don't want to just be like, oh, but especially in, in the masculine kind of disposition, like being male. I don't know. I mean, I don't know where I'm going with, you know, I'm just spitballing it's, it's it. But... Like, it's it's the angst. Yeah. And like there is no angst right now. And if there is, it's like not censored it's like personally censored and if you want to talk the difference between the genders i feel like the 90s was more of women being angsty like when you listen to like riot girl music and shit right. like that and then when you get into like the emo shit like that was like when like men the next like decade of men that came up right were like oh well i have feelings too like quit acting like men don't have feelings here we go and, and they're the buried fuck... in a different way yeah so like now papa roach is popular like right. how the fuck did that happen you know like... <laughs> and it, it was like it was like buried in these kind of exaggerated violence lyrics right like the black my wrist cut my eye or black my eyes cut my wrists you know that this kind of but then it's like it's kind of a love song because he's doing it because he's so in love with this woman you know i think bukowski captures that too the yearning and maybe that's biological where like men we get obsessed with a woman that we're in love with like we will do anything like we would die for it you know like we would kill well, ourselves over it like when, when the when, when the woman leaves like yeah right? like you would kill yourself over the loss of that he has a poem in here i guess we didn't cover it when he's he's talking about the knives that women carry in their purses and shove into your gut right and then you like he's talking about that guy mowing his lawn he's like he doesn't seem to have any knives in his gut you can have one yeah. of mine. Here's one from 1964. You know, like this woman shoved it in and left. And then like, uh, again, tale as old as time, really, right? Like you want that and then men don't really know how to keep it. Uh, yeah. And then. But when they have it, they don't want it. Because there's yeah. that other is where the woman comes in and he takes a knife out and he cuts his balls off. Right. And sits back down she's screaming her fucking head off. And then um, she leaves and he says that poem ends with um, 
It's so amazing. Something like when you're alone, like when you're finally alone, you don't really feel that alone anymore or something like that. I'm totally fucking that up, but I can't remember the name of the poem, but it's one of the early ones. That but little it, bluebird comes up when you're yeah. alone. That little bluebird can come up and you fucking let it out. Up. Yeah. I always think that man, like I, and I've the movie scenes and stuff that always choke me up are the ones that do that, that express that, you know, like that, like every year I watch It's a Wonderful Life, you know, and I'm just crying like by the end of this movie. And there's so many, it's always the same scenes. It's always the yeah. same scenes. That scene when he just like, you know, he, and, and, and he's yearning, right? Like George in that movie, he's yearning for this adventure, for this, this, this things. Yeah. And there's a little bluebird in him and he's trying to drown it out and, and to just go on his thing. And it never works, you know, like it never works. And it just... Man, it was that scene when they're on the phone, right? And his buddy's telling him to get in on the ground floor of the plastics factory or whatever. And they're getting closer and closer to one another on the phone. And then he's just, she's like, he says it's the chance of a lifetime. And he just grabs her and he's like, now you listen to me. (laughs) I don't want any plastics and I don't want any ground floors. And I'm leaving tomorrow. Do you understand me? I'm never getting married. And then they just start like crying and kissing each other. And it's just, yeah, like he's trying to fight that bluebird and it's coming up and like, yeah. It yeah. Who would have thought up. doing a podcast about Bukowski, we would have the male fucking feelings hour. <laughs> well, I think it's important, dude. Like I, I think his good. reputation, I think it, it's, it's, it's such a legacy of a lot of these writers like this, like even the really ones that are really masculine, that there's that sensitivity or tenderness underneath some of that masculinity, I don't know. I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, it's just talking on a podcast, but yeah. And then like the whole idea you brought up earlier about women liking him too, you know, like, like I have a much broader female readership than I do male, which boggles my fucking mind. And I think a lot of it has to do with not so much like they could tell that he's sweet they could tell that he's broken right? and that he needs nurturing and that he could be fixed. And for someone who is broken, who needs nurturing, that seems amazing until someone actually wants to try to change you and fix you. And then you're fucking pissed off and mad about it. And it's this fucking cycle that just keeps fucking repeating. You know, you know? I, I, I know she's controversial, but I like Camille Paglia and, and she, would write about this in the eighties and nineties where she said she realized in her thirties where she had male students that would like look at her with this kind of misty eyed look where she said she realized, Oh, I'm the mother. Like she said, men want to be nurtured and they want to be approved of by like a mother figure. Like they, they kind of, they desire it so much. And that's why she comes to that conclusion that actually women are the most powerful, you know, people on the planet because they can, give that to men or take it away from them. So when men are like, oh, I'm beaten down by this woman, it's because she's not nurturing and giving you the stuff that you want approval. You want approval from her and you want the nurturing from her at the same time. And of course that puts a lot of burden on women to do that. But like, it's still like, if like, yeah, it is this, it's so simple when you start to think about it and the kind of the sex relations and, and how it evolved into this, like it's so simple, but at the same time, you know, how many men destroy their lives over a woman, you know, over, over chasing tail, like so many the tail as old as time. How many civil civilizations have been destroyed because right. a guy was to impress a piece of ass. Right. Helen of Troy, right? Like the, 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 the foundational documents of the Western world are about that where it's, yeah, they want to. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, yeah. I mean, I don't have any, answers to go off of for that listeners but it's just crazy and it's just very interesting to think about and i think it don't get the men don't get their fair shake in terms of that tenderness and i understand yeah. why because there's all the whole other side to men too where it can be very violent and destructive and 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 things like that but underneath it all they're just these little boys right like we are just we want our moms like kind of <sighs> yeah I don't, is it wanting, 
a more of a mother figure or is it wanting the sexual power or is this going to turn into like a Freud thing and it's just like we all want to just fuck our moms well there's something to that I think yeah uh, I, people I guess they, they Freud was so long ago that people kind of misunderstand too I think what he was getting at with that whereas uh, wait the cliff notes <laughs> yeah like the the kind of the Oedipal structure where you're you don't even know you're desiring that. It's not a conscious desire that you're trying to go out there and seek that. You basically want a mother that you can fuck. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Because those are the three things that you would want more. The, the, the nurturing, the approval, and then you want to be able to fuck, too. Like, those are, like, the three things. So then, like, that puts the... And, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, because nobody can be born without a mother, right? So it puts the life giver, the women, in this... That's why the Pagli, I think it's a bad rap too where she's actually much more feminist than people give her credit for where she's putting women at the top of the hierarchy in this kind of structure where they're the life givers they're the they're the ones that, that nothing could be possible without and then uh yeah i don't know and then the way that they can control men you know yeah, like, but there's a, there's this other bukowski bit where he says um <clears throat> like the pussy was the first thing he ever saw and the whole his whole the whole rest of his life he'd been trying to get back up to it going from the other way and not having very good luck at it right you know like <laughs> and you, i guess you, if we broaden that we could say that's the oedipal freudian structure right like the oedipus the oedipus rex the uh kill your father and uh and marry your mother jesus christ the conquering and there's there's been studies with apes and stuff too where there's certain numbers like you can't have more than like the male if there's too many males in like a little tribe of apes or whatever they start killing each other you know like kind of that like there has to be like some type of structure but yeah man i mean i think this is the reason i think that a lot of people are drawn to bukowski is because of that he's capturing that maybe not as articulately as you know some academic would or whatever but it's like that's the thing because right. like you can understand it like right. oh yeah that's what he's saying instead of like is this person saying this or is he talking about a microwave pizza like yeah. what is this really but like bukowski it's like no this is exactly what i'm fucking talking about this is what we're all fucking going through like and you can understand it without understanding it, kind of. You know, like you don't have to understand it on this deep level that we're trying to get into here with male tenderness, blah, blah, blah. Like, you can just read it and understand, like, without going any deeper, you know? Like, I am alone. That sucks. Yeah. yeah. And like, I'm yearning you... for that companionship. That, yeah. Very interesting stuff, man. This is why I needed Matt Wall to come on for Bukowski. Yeah. <laughs> This turned into something way different than I thought. That's what I like about it, dude. I hope listeners feel that way too, because it's like, yeah, let's you want you down to move on to some self publishing chat? We, we, uh... Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Hell yeah, hell yeah. <clears throat> Don't want to beat this dead horse too much. <sighs> so yeah, read a book of Bukowski. Read Bukowski, sure. listeners. It's in there. It's in the description. Uh... And honestly, if all you know is his hard luck bullshit pick up Hollywood and read that just so you could see a fucking happy ending for once. Even women, like when you see, when you read women, it's misogynist. Sure. And he's talking about like the sexual attraction, like your men are attracted to female body parts. Sorry, lady. That's just what it is. You're a straight man, tits and ass. You're, you're, you're constantly oogling it, but it's like, yeah. there's a sensitivity to it. The scene that stands out to me in women that I'll never forget is when he's talking about that redhead and her hair. And how hot her hair is. Like, he's so attracted to that hair. And he yeah. keeps talking about it and talking about it. He doesn't even care about her body. He's like, it's the hair. And it's this, like, that's a sensitivity. I think that's a vulnerable sensitivity where he could just be talking about her butt cheeks, but he's not. He's talking about this long, luscious, thick mane of hair that's turning him on. And yeah. Well, like, the thing about women that always hits me, and this is probably why a lot of people hate it, because you have to get through a big-ass fucking book to get to this. <laughs> but 
I'm going to spoil the book for you guys. I'm going to ruin it. I'm going to give you the ending right now. So the whole book is him coming to grips with the idea that he's now in his 50s and women who were like 20 years younger than him and sometimes even younger than that are wanting to fuck him. And he's never had women before. And so he's going through all these chicks that are all different and all amazing and all like horrific in their own right and whatever. And like out of his league, yeah. Of his league, and then he finally sees someone who is a good woman and treating him well, and he realizes that he's a piece of shit. And he gets a phone call, and some hot chick wants to fuck him, and he says no. Right. And he feels good, and he gets up for finally saying no, and he feeds a cat a can of tuna. And feels like he did the right thing. And that is like the Darth Vader throwing the Emperor into the center of the Death Star. Yeah. You know, it's his redemption. And most people, when they read women, they never even get to the redemption because they're so put off by the 14 year old boy mentality of what a naked girl's like. Right. And that, like, but it's, you have to see the ugliness. So when the redemption comes, it makes sense. And it's like, wow, this motherfucker grew. And it's desired. He wanted that. Yeah. It makes him feel good to achieve that level of maturity. Yeah. And it kind of, in that sense, too, it's empowering for men to be able to say no to, you know, a beautiful woman throwing herself at you. Yeah. Like, because most men are powerless in that situation. And then it's like, if you can mature enough or at least find that little bluebird in you enough to say no to it it i don't know you get more meaning or more satisfaction out of the relationship and stuff than you would brings us all back around to that interview he did with that guy and that guy didn't see what the point of the book of women was and he was so fucking offended that this guy did not take anything out of the book that he put into the book. The redemption is the story of that book. Yeah. Um, And sometimes you can see, I guess that's like the shock factor, right? So there's like the shock factor where like you see and all that. And then sometimes people, this is where it could sometimes get dangerous for the writers out there listening. Cause sometimes the shock will overshadow what you're trying to go for like that because the shock is fun but then there's always something behind the shock, you know, like the shock should be used to the, to the work's advantage, the poem's advantage, the story's advantage, whatever. Uh, and that's a big difference maker, I think, in terms of are you just saying stuff to shock people? Or are you using the shock to get something else across, you know, the. Well, it's it's kind of the same thing with like uber religious communities. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you've been in the church like that before, but like there will be times when the church wants people to come up and give their testimony about how they came to God, how they came to Christ. And so they go up there and they talk for 15 minutes about all the horrible shit they did and what a piece of garbage they are. And then they found God and then everyone's clapping. It's like the redemption is like the end of the story. You know, it's not like, People go, oh, I was a piece of shit. But then all these great things happen. Let me tell you what they all are. Like, people usually don't tell you that. They tell you all the nasty, horrible shit so you can see how far they've come. You know, like, if he would have called the book Woman um, Settling Down or Marriage, maybe people would have, like, stuck around to the end to see what happens. But he called it fucking women. He could have called it fucking. Because I think in... Many, the book was called Fuck Machine. <laughs> the title they gave it. <laughs> Burying the lead there, guys. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Fucking Bukowski. So for that, listeners, you should all go out there and read Bukowski. And then stick around so you can hear Matt Wall talk about uh, self-publishing. <laughs> Heavy. Bored.
bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy bored. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.